Poems Every Child Should Know, edited by Mary E. Burt. Section 51, read for LibriVox.org by Kara Schallenberg. This section contains um, just one poem, really half of a poem. It is Part 2 of Horatius at the Bridge. Part 4 continued. The three stood calm and silent, and looked upon the foes, and a great shout of laughter from all the vanguard rose, and forth three chiefs came spurring before that deep array. To earth they sprang, their swords they drew, and lifted high their shields, and flew to win the narrow way. On us from green Tifernum, lord of the hill of vines, and Sayus, whose eight hundred slaves sicken in Ilva's mines, and Picus, long to Clusium, vassal in peace and war, who led to fight his Umbrian powers from that grey crag where, girt with towers, the fortress of Nequinium lowers o'er the pale waves of Nar. Stout Lartius hurled down on us into the stream beneath. Herminius struck at Sayus and clove him to the teeth. At Picus brave Horatius darted one fiery thrust, and the proud Umbrian's gilded arms clashed in the bloody dust. Then Ocnus of Faleri rushed on the Roman three, and Lossilus of Ergo, the rover of the sea, and Arons of Volsinium, who slew the great wild boar, the great wild boar that had his den amid the reeds of Cosa's fen, and wasted fields and slaughtered men along Albinia's shore. Herminius smote down Arons, Lartius laid Ocnus low, right to the heart of Lausulus Horatius sent a blow. Lie there, he cried, fell pirate, no more aghast and pale, from Ostia's walls the crowd shall mark the tracks of thy destroying bark, no more Campania's hinds shall fly to woods and caverns when they spy thy thrice accursed sail. But now no sound of laughter was heard among the foes, A wild and wrathful clamour from all the vanguard rose. Six spears' length from the entrance halted that deep array, And for a space no man came forth to win the narrow way. But hark! the cry is Aster, and lo! the ranks divide, And the great lord of Luna comes with his stately stride. Upon his ample shoulders clangs loud the fourfold shield, and in his hand he shakes the brand which none but he can wield. He smiled on those bold Romans, a smile serene and high. He eyed the flinching Tuscans, and scorn was in his eye. Quoth he, The she-wolf's litter stand savagely at bay, but will ye dare to follow if Aster clears the way? Then whirling up his broadsword with both hands to the height, he rushed against Horatius, and smote with all his might. With shield and blade Horatius right deftly turned the blow. The blow, though turned, came yet too nigh. It missed his helm, but gashed his thigh. The Tuscans raised a joyful cry to see the red blood flow. He reeled, and on Herminius he leaned one breathing space. Then, like a wild cat mad with wounds, sprang right at Aster's face. Through teeth and skull and helmet so fierce a thrust he sped, The good sword stood a handbreadth out behind the Tuscan's head. And the great lord of Luna fell at the deadly stroke, As falls on Mount Alvernus a thunder-smitten oak. Far o'er the crashing forest the giant arms lie spread, And the pale augurs muttering low gaze on the blasted head. On Aster's throat Horatius right firmly pressed his heel, and thrice and four times tugged amain ere he wrenched out the steel. And see, he cried, the welcome, fair guests, that waits you here, what noble Lucomo comes next to taste our Roman cheer. But at his haughty challenge a sullen murmur ran, mingled of wrath and shame and dread along that glittering van. There lacked not men of prowess, nor men of lordly race, for all Etruria's noblest were round the fatal place. But all Etruria's noblest felt their heart sink to see on the earth the bloody corpses in the path the dauntless three, 
and from the ghastly entrance where those bold Romans stood, all shrank like boys who, unaware, ranging the woods to start a hare, come to the mouth of the dark lair where, growling low, a fierce old bear lies amid bones and blood. Was none who would be foremost to lead such dire attack? But those behind cried forward, and those before cried back, and backward now and forward wavers the deep array, and on the tossing sea of steel to and fro the standards reel, and the victorious trumpet peal dies fitfully away. Yet one man for one moment strode out before the crowd, well known was he to all the three, and they gave him greeting loud. Now welcome, welcome, Sextus, now welcome to thy home. Why dost thou stay and turn away? Here lies the road to Rome. Thrice looked he at the city, thrice looked he at the dead, and thrice came on in fury, and thrice turned back in dread. And, white with fear and hatred, scowled at the narrow way, where, wallowing in a pool of blood, the bravest Tuscans lay. But meanwhile axe and lever have manfully been plied, and now the bridge hangs tottering above the boiling tide. "'Come back, come back, Horatius!' loud cried the fathers all. "'Back, Lartius, back, Herminius, back, ere the ruin fall!' Back darted Spurius Lartius, Herminius darted back, and as they passed beneath their feet they felt the timbers crack. But when they turned their faces, and on the farther shore saw brave Horatius stand alone, they would have crossed once more. But with a crash like thunder fell every loosened beam, and like a dam the mighty wreck lay right athwart the stream. And a long shout of triumph rose from the walls of Rome, as to the highest turret tops was splashed the yellow foam. And like a horse unbroken when first he feels the rain, the furious river struggled hard and tossed his tawny mane, and burst the curb and bounded, rejoicing to be free, and whirling down in fierce career, battlement and plank and pier, rushed headlong to the sea. Alone stood brave Horatius, but constant still in mind, thrice thirty thousand foes before, and the broad flood behind. Down with him, cried false Sextus, with a smile on his pale face. Now yield thee, cried Lars Porsena, now yield thee to our grace. Round turned he, as not deigning those craven ranks to see. Not spake he to Lars Porsena, to Sextus not spake he. But he saw on Palatinus the white porch of his home, and he spake to the noble river that rolls by the towers of Rome. O Tiber, Father Tiber, to whom the Romans pray, a Roman's life, a Roman's arms, take thou in charge this day. So he spake, and speaking, sheathed the good sword by his side, and with his harness on his back, plunged headlong in the tide. No sound of joy or sorrow was heard from either bank, but friends and foes in dumb surprise, with parted lips and straining eyes, stood gazing where he sank. And when above the surges they saw his crest appear, all Rome sent forth a rapturous cry, and even the ranks of Tuscany could scarce forbear to cheer. And fiercely ran the current, swollen high by months of rain, and fast his blood was flowing, and he was sore in pain, and heavy with his armour, and spent with changing blows, and oft they thought him sinking, but still again he rose. Never, I ween, did swimmer in such an evil case struggle through such a raging flood safe to the landing-place. But his limbs were borne up bravely by the brave heart within, and our good father Tiber bore bravely up his chin. Curse on him, quoth false Sextus, we'll not the villain drown. But for this day, ere close of day, we should have sacked the town. Heaven help him, quoth Lars Porsena, and bring him safe to shore, for such a gallant feat of arms was never seen before. And now he feels the bottom, now on dry earth he stands, now round him throng the fathers to press his gory hands, and now, with shouts and clapping and noise of weeping loud, he enters through the river-gate, borne by the joyous crowd. 
They gave him of the corn-land that it was of public right, as much as two strong oxen could plough from morn till night. And they made a molten image, and set it up on high, and there it stands unto this day, to witness if I lie. It stands in the comitium, plain for all folk to see, Horatius in his harness, halting upon one knee, and underneath is written, in letters all of gold, how valiantly he kept the bridge in the brave days of old. And still his name sounds stirring unto the men of Rome, as the trumpet blast that cries to them to charge the Volscian home, and wives still pray to Juno for boys with hearts as bold as he who kept the bridge so well in the brave days of old. And in the nights of winter, when the cold north winds blow, and the long howling of the wolves is heard amid the snow, when round the lonely cottage roars loud the tempest's din, and the good logs of Algidas roar louder yet within, when the oldest cask is opened, and the largest lamp is lit, when the chestnuts glow in the embers, and the kid turns on the spit, when young and old in circle around the firebrands close, when the girls are weaving baskets, and the lads are shaping bows, when the good man mends his armour and trims his helmet's plume, when the good wife's shuttle merrily goes flashing through the loom, with weeping and with laughter still is the story told, how well Horatius kept the bridge in the brave days of old. Thomas B. Macaulay. End of section 51. Read by Kara Schallenberg on November 10, 2006, in Oceanside, California. Poems Every Child Should Know. Edited by Mary E. Burt. Section 52. Read for LibriVox.org by Kara Schallenberg. This section contains just one poem. THE PLANTING OF THE APPLE TREE Part 4 continued The planting of the apple tree has become a favourite for Arbor Day exercises. The planting of trees, as against their destruction, is a vital point in our political and national welfare. Come, let us plant the apple tree, cleave the tough green sword with the spade. Wide let its hollow bed be made. There gently lay the roots, and there sift the dark mould with kindly care, and press it o'er them tenderly, as round the sleeping infant's feet we softly fold the cradle-sheet. So plant we the apple-tree. What plant we in this apple-tree? Buds, which the breath of summer days shall lengthen into leafy sprays, boughs where the thrush with crimson breast shall haunt and sing and hide her nest. We plant upon the sunny lea a shadow for the noontide hour, a shelter from the summer shower, when we plant the apple tree. What plant we in this apple tree? Sweets for a hundred flowery springs to load the May wind's restless wings, when from the orchard row he pours its fragrance through our open doors, a world of blossoms for the bee, flowers for the sick girl's silent room. For the glad infant springs of bloom, we plant with the apple tree. What plant we in this apple tree? Fruits that shall swell in sunny June, and redden in the August noon, and drop when gentle airs come by that fan the blue September sky. While children come with cries of glee and seek them where the fragrant grass betrays their bed to those who pass at the foot of the apple tree. And when, above this apple-tree, the winter stars are quivering bright, the winds go howling through the night, girls, whose eyes o'erflow with mirth, shall peel its fruit by cottage hearth, and guests in prouder homes shall see, heaped with the grape of Sintra's vine, and golden orange of the line, the fruit of the apple-tree. The fruitage of this apple-tree... Winds and our flag of stripe and star shall bear to coasts that lie afar, where men shall wonder at the view, and ask in what fair groves they grew, and sojourners beyond the sea shall think of childhood's careless day, and long, long hours of summer play, in the shade of the apple-tree. 
Each year shall give this apple tree a broader flush of roseate bloom, a deeper maze of verdurous gloom, and loosen when the frost clouds lower the crisp brown leaves in thicker shower. The years shall come and pass, but we shall hear no longer where we lie, the summer songs, the autumn sigh, in the boughs of the apple tree. And time shall waste this apple tree, oh, when its aged branches throw thin shadows on the ground below, shall fraud and force and iron will oppress the weak and helpless still. What shall the tasks of mercy be amid the toils, the strifes, the tears, of those who live when length of years is wasting this apple tree? Who planted this old apple tree? The children of that distant day, thus to some aged man shall say, and gazing on its mossy stem, the grey-haired man shall answer them. A poet of the land was he, born in the rude but good old times. Tis said he made some quaint old rhymes on planting the apple tree. William Cullen Bryant End of section 52 Read by Kara Schallenberg on November 10, 2006 In Oceanside, California Poems Every Child Should Know, edited by Mary E. Burt. Section 53, read for LibriVox.org by Kara Schallenberg. This section contains the following poems. June, A Psalm of Life, and Barnacles. Part 5, On and On. June, June by James Russell Lowell, 1819-1891, is a fragment from The Vision of Sir Launfall. It finds a place in this volume because it is the most perfect description of a charming day ever written. What is so rare as a day in June? Then, if ever, come perfect days. Then heaven tries the earth if it be in tune, and over it softly her warm ear lays. Whether we look or whether we listen, we hear life murmur, or see it glisten. Every clod feels a stir of might, an instinct within it that reaches and towers, and groping blindly above it for light, climbs to a soul in grass and flowers. The flush of life may well be seen thrilling back over hills and valleys. The cowslip startles in meadows green. The buttercup catches the sun in its chalice. And there's never a leaf nor a blade too mean To be some happy creature's palace. The little bird sits at his door in the sun, A tilt like a blossom among the leaves, And lets his illumined being o'errun With the deluge of summer it receives. His mate feels the eggs beneath her wings, And the heart in her dumb breast flutters and sings. He sings to the wide world, and she to her nest, In the nice ear of nature, which song is the best? James Russell Lowell A Psalm of Life What the Heart of the Young Man Said to the Psalmist A Psalm of Life by Henry W. Longfellow, 1807-1882, to is like a treasure laid up in heaven. It should be learned for its future value to the child, not necessarily because the child likes it. Its value will dawn on him. Tell me not, in mournful numbers, life is but an empty dream, for the soul is dead that slumbers, and things are not what they seem. Life is real, life is earnest, and the grave is not its goal. Dust thou art, to dust returnest, was not spoken of the soul. Not enjoyment, and not sorrow is our destined end or way, but to act that each to-morrow find us farther than to-day. Art is long, and time is fleeting, and our hearts, though stout and brave, still, like muffled drums, are beating funeral marches to the grave. In the world's broad field of battle, in the bivouac of life, be not like dumb driven cattle, be a hero in the strife. Trust no future, however pleasant, let the dead past bury its dead. Act, act in the living present, heart within, and God o'erhead. 
Lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime, and, departing, leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. Footprints that perhaps another, sailing o'er life's solemn main, a forlorn and shipwrecked brother, seeing, shall take heart again. Let us then be up and doing, with a heart for any fate, still achieving, still pursuing, learn to labour and to wait. Henry W. Longfellow Barnacles Barnacles by Sidney Lanier, 1842-1881, to is a poem that I teach in connection with my lessons on natural history. We have a good specimen of a barnacle, and the children see them on the shells on the coast. The ethical point is invaluable. My soul is sailing through the sea, but the past is heavy and hindereth me. The path hath crusted cumbrous shells that hold the flesh of cold sea-mells about my soul. The huge waves wash, the high waves roll, each barnacle clingeth and worketh dull, and hindereth me from sailing. Old past, let go and drop i' the sea, till fathomless waters cover thee. For I am living, but thou art dead, thou drawest back, I strive ahead, the day to find. Thy shells unbind, night comes behind, I needs must hurry with the wind, and trim me best for sailing. Sidney Lanier End of section 53 Read by Kara Schallenberg On November 17, 2006, in Oceanside, California Poems Every Child Should Know Edited by Mary E. Burt Section 54 Read for LibriVox.org by Kara Schallenberg This section contains the following poems A Happy Life Home Sweet Home Juliet of Nations and Woodman Spare That Tree Part 5 Continued A Happy Life how happy is he, born and taught, That serveth not another's will, Whose armour is his honest thought, And simple truth his utmost skill, Whose passions not his masters are, Whose soul is still prepared for death, Not tied unto the world with care Of public fame or private breath. Sir Henry Wotton Home Sweet Home Home Sweet Home by John Howard Payne, 1791-1852, is a poem that reaches into the heart. What is home? A place where we experience independence, safety, privacy, and where we can dispense hospitality. The family is the true unit. Mid pleasures and palaces, though we may roam, be it ever so humble, there's no place like home. A charm from the sky seems to hallow us there, which, seek through the world, is ne'er met with elsewhere. Home, home, sweet, sweet home, there's no place like home, there's no place like home. An exile from home, splendor dazzles in vain, oh, give me my lowly thatched cottage again, the birds singing gaily that come at my call, give me them, and the peace of mind dearer than all. Home, home, sweet, sweet home, There's no place like home, There's no place like home. How sweet tis to sit neath a fond father's smile, And the cares of a mother to soothe and beguile. Let others delight mid new pleasures to roam, But give me, oh, give me the pleasures of home. Home, home, sweet, sweet home, There's no place like home, There's no place like home. To thee I'll return, overburdened with care, The heart's dearest solace will smile on me there. No more from that cottage again will I roam, Be it ever so humble, there's no place like home. Home, home, sweet, sweet home, There's no place like home, There's no place like home. John Howard Payne From Casa Guidi Windows Juliet of Nations 
I heard last night a little child go singing neath Casa Guidi windows by the church. O oh, bella liberta, O oh, bella, stringing the same words still on notes he went in search, so high for, you concluded the upspringing of such a nimble bird to sky from perch, must leave the whole bush in a tremble green, and that the heart of Italy must beat, while such a voice had leave to rise serene twixt church and palace of a Florence street. A little child, too, who not long had been by mother's finger steadied on his feet, and still, O oh, bella liberta, he sang. Elizabeth Barrett Browning Woodman Spare That Tree Woodman, Spare That Tree, by George Pope Morris, 1802 to 1864, is included in this collection because I have loved it all my life, and I never knew anyone who could or would offer a criticism upon it. Its value lies in its recognition of childhood's pleasures. Woodman, Spare That Tree, Touch Not a Single Bough. In youth it sheltered me, and I'll protect it now. "'Twas my forefather's hand that placed it near his cot. "'There, woodman, let it stand. "'Thy axe shall harm it not. "'That old familiar tree, whose glory and renown "'are spread o'er land and sea, and wouldst thou hew it down? "'Woodman, forbear thy stroke, cut not its earth-bound ties. "'O oh, spare that aged oak, now towering to the skies.' When but an idle boy I sought its grateful shade, In all their gushing joy here too my sisters played. My mother kissed me here, my father pressed my hand. Forgive this foolish tear, but let that old oak stand. My heart-strings round thee cling, close as thy bark, old friend. Here shall the wild bird sing, and still thy branches bend. Old tree, the storm still brave, and woodman leave the spot. While I've a hand to save, thy axe shall harm it not. George Pope Morris End of section 54 Read by Kara Schallenberg on November 17, 2006 in Oceanside, California Poems Every Child Should Know Edited by Mary E. Burt. Section 55. Read for LibriVox.org by Kara Schallenberg. This section contains the following poems. Abide with me. Lead kindly light. The last rose of summer and Annie Laurie. Part 5 continued. Abide with me. Abide with me by Henry Francis Light. 1793 to 1847, appeals to our natural longing for the unchanging, and to our love of security. Abide with me, fast falls the eventide, the darkness deepens, Lord with me abide. When other helpers fail and comforts flee, help of the helpless, O oh, abide with me. Swift to its close ebbs out life's little day, Earth's joys grow dim, its glories pass away. Change and decay in all around I see. O thou who changest not, abide with me. Henry Francis Light Lead, Kindly Light Lead, Kindly Light by John Henry Newman, 1801-1890, was written when Cardinal Newman was in the stress and strain of perplexity and mental distress and bodily pain. The poem has been a star in the darkness to thousands. It was the favorite poem of President McKinley. Lead, kindly light, amid the encircling gloom, lead thou me on. The night is dark, and I am far from home, lead thou me on. Keep thou my feet, I do not ask to see the distant scene, one step enough for me. I was not ever thus, nor prayed that thou shouldst lead me on. I loved to choose and see my path, but now lead thou me on. I loved the garish day, and in spite of fears, pride ruled my will. Remember not past years. So long thy power hath blessed me, 
sure it still will lead me on, O'er moor and fen, o'er crag and torrent, Till the night is gone. And with the morn those angel faces smile, Which I have loved long since, and lost a while. John Henry Newman THE LAST ROSE OF SUMMER Tis the last rose of summer left blooming alone, All her lovely companions are faded and gone. No flower of her kindred, no rosebud is nigh, To reflect back her blushes, or give sigh for sigh. I'll not leave thee, thou lone one, to pine on the stem. Since the lovely are sleeping, go sleep thou with them. Thus kindly I scatter thy leaves o'er the bed Where thy mates of the garden lie scentless and dead. So soon may I follow when friendships decay, And from love's shining circle the gems drop away. When true hearts lie withered, and fond ones are flown, Oh, who would inhabit this bleak world alone? Thomas More Annie Laurie Annie Laurie finds a place in this collection because it is the most popular song on earth. Written by William Douglas Maxwell's and Bray's are bonny, where early falls the dew, and it's there that Annie Laurie gid me her promise true. Gid me her promise true, which ne'er forgot will be, and for bonny Annie Laurie I'd lay me down and dee. Her brow is like the snawdrift, her throat is like the swan, her face it is the fairest that e'er the sun shone on, that e'er the sun shone on, and dark blue is her e, and for bonny Annie Laurie I'd lay me down and dee. Like dew on the goan dying is the fa o' her fairy feet, like the winds in summer sighing her voice is low and sweet, her voice is low and sweet, and she's all the world to me, and for bonny Annie Laurie I'd lay me down and dee. William Douglas End of section 55 Read by Kara Schallenberg on November 22nd, 2006 In Oceanside, California Poems Every Child Should Know Edited by Mary E. Burt Section 56 Read for LibriVox.org by Kara Schallenberg This section contains the following poems the Ship of State, America, and The Landing of the Pilgrims. Part 5 continued. The Ship of State. A president of a well-known college writes me that The Ship of State was his favorite poem when he was a boy, and did more than any other to shape his course in life. Sail on, sail on, O Ship of State! Sail on, O Union, strong and great! Humanity, with all its fears, With all the hopes of future years, Is hanging breathless on thy fate. We know what master laid thy keel, What workmen wrought thy ribs of steel, Who made each mast, and sail, and rope, What anvils rang, what hammers beat, In what a forge and what a heat Were forged the anchors of thy hope. Fear not each sudden sound and shock, "'Tis of the wave, and not the rock. "'Tis but the flapping of the sail, "'and not a rent made by the gale. "'In spite of rock and tempest roar, "'in spite of false lights on the shore, "'sail on, nor fear to breast the sea. "'Our hearts, our hopes, are all with thee. "'Our hearts, our hopes, our prayers, our tears, "'our faith, triumphant o'er our fears, "'are all with thee, are all with thee.' Henry W. Longfellow America America by Samuel Francis Smith, 1808-1895, is a good poem to learn as a poem, regardless of the fact that every American who can sing it ought to know it, that he may join in the chorus when patriotic celebrations call for it. My boys love to repeat the entire poem, but I often find masses of people trying to sing it, knowing only one stanza. It is our national anthem, and a part of our education to know every word of it. My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, 
of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside let freedom ring. My native country, thee, land of the noble free, thy name I love. I love thy rocks and rills, thy woods and templed hills, my heart with rapture thrills, like that above. Let music swell the breeze, and ring from all the trees, sweet freedom's song. Let mortal tongues awake, let all that breathe partake, let rocks their silence break, the sound prolong. Our Father's God, to thee, author of liberty, to thee we sing. Long may our land be bright with freedom's holy light. Protect us by thy might, great God, our King. S. F. Smith The Landing of the Pilgrims The Landing of the Pilgrims by Felicia Hammonds, 1749-1835, is a poem that children want when they study the early history of America. The breaking waves dashed high on a stern and rock-bound coast, and the woods against a stormy sky their giant branches tossed. And the heavy night hung dark, the hills and waters o'er, When a band of exiles moored their bark On the wild New England shore. Not as the conqueror comes, they, the true-hearted, came, Not with the roll of the stirring drums, And the trumpet that sings of fame. Not as the flying come, in silence and in fear, They shook the depths of the desert gloom With their hymns of lofty cheer. Amid the storm they sang, and the stars heard, and the sea, and the sounding aisles of the dim woods rang to the anthem of the free. The ocean eagle soared from his nest by the white wave's foam, and the rocking pines of the forest roared. This was their welcome home. There were men with hoary hair amid that pilgrim band. Why had they come to wither there, away from their childhood's land? There was woman's fearless eye, lit by her deep love's truth. There was manhood's brow serenely high, and the fiery heart of youth. What sought they thus afar, bright jewels of the mine, the wealth of seas, the spoils of war? They sought a faith's pure shrine. I call it holy ground, the soil where first they trod. They have left unstained what there they found, freedom to worship God. Felicia Hemmons. End of section fifty six. Read by Kara Schallenberg on November twenty second, two thousand six, in Oceanside, California. Poems Every Child Should Know. Edited by Mary E. Burt. Section fifty seven. Read for LibriVox.org by Kara Schallenberg. This section contains the following poems, The Lotus Eaters, and Moli. Part 5 continued. The Lotus Eaters. The main idea in The Lotus Eaters is, are we justified in running away from unpleasant duties, or is insensibility justifiable? Laddie, do you recollect learning this poem after we had read the story of Odysseus? the struggle of the soul urged to action, but held back by the spirit of self-indulgence. These were the points we discussed. "'Courage,' he said, and pointed toward the land. "'This mounting wave will roll us shoreward soon.' In the afternoon they came unto a land in which it seemed always afternoon. All round the coast the languid air did swoon, breathing like one that hath a weary dream." Full-faced above the valley stood the moon, And like a downward smoke the slender stream Along the cliff to fall and pause and fall did seem. A land of streams, some, like a downward smoke, Slow-dropping veils of thinnest lawn did go, And some through wavering lights and shadows broke, Rolling a slumbrous sheet of foam below. They saw the gleaming river seaward flow from the inner land, far off three mountain-tops, 
Three silent pinnacles of aged snow stood sunset flushed and dewed with showery drops, up clomb the shadowy pine above the woven copse. The charmed sunset lingered low adown in the red west, through mountain clefts the dale was seen far inland, and the yellow down, bordered with palm, and many a winding vale and meadow, set with slender gallingale, a land where all things always seemed the same, and round about the keel with faces pale, dark faces pale against that rosy flame, the mild-eyed, melancholy, lotus-eaters came. Branches they bore of that enchanted stem, laden with flower and fruit, whereof they gave to each, but whoso did receive of them and taste, to him the gushing of the wave, far, far away, did seem to mourn and rave on alien shores, and if his fellow spake his voice was thin, as voices from the grave. And deep asleep he seemed, yet all awake, and music in his ears his beating heart did make. They sat them down upon the yellow sand, between the sun and moon upon the shore, and sweet it was to dream of fatherland, of child and wife and slave, but evermore most weary seemed the sea, weary the oar. Weary the wandering fields of barren foam. Then some one said, We will return no more, and all at once they sang, Our island home is far beyond the wave. We will no longer roam. Alfred Tennyson Moli Moli, by Edith M. Thomas, born 1850, is the best possible presentation of the value of integrity. This poem ranks with Sir Galahad, if not above it. It is a stroke of genius, and every American ought to be proud of it. Every time my boys read Odysseus, or the story of Ulysses with me, we read or learn moly. The plant moly grows in the United States, as well as in Europe. Traveller, pluck a stem of moly, if thou touch at Circe's isle. Hermes Moly, growing solely, to undo enchanter's wile. When she proffers thee her chalice, wine and spices mixed with malice, when she smites thee with her staff to transform thee, do thou laugh. Safe thou art if thou but bear the least leaf of Moly rare. Close it grows beside her portal, springing from a stock immortal. Yes, and often has the witch sought to tear it from its niche, but to thwart her cruel will, the wise God renews it still. Though it grows in soil perverse, heaven hath been its jealous nurse, and a flower of snowy mark springs from root and sheathing dark. Kingly safeguard, only herb, that can brutish passion curb. Some do think its name should be shield-heart, white integrity. Traveller, pluck a stem of moly, if thou touch at Circe's isle, Hermes moly, growing solely, to undo enchanter's wile. Edith M. Thomas End of section 57 Read by Kara Schallenberg on November 22, 2006 In Oceanside, California Poems Every Child Should Know Edited by Mary E. Burt. Section 58. Read for LibriVox.org by Kara Schallenberg. This section contains the following poems. Cupid Drowned. Cupid Stung. Cupid and My Camposby. And A Ballad for a Boy. Part 5 continued. Cupid Drowned. Cupid Drowned, Cupid Stung, and Cupid and My Camposby are three dainty poems recommended by Mrs. Margaret Mooney, of the Albany Teachers' College, in her Foundation Studies in Literature. Children are always delighted with them. T'other day, as I was twining roses for a crown to dine in, what of all things mid the heap should I light on fast asleep but the little desperate elf? 
the tiny traitor, love himself. By the wings I picked him up like a bee, and in a cup of my wine I plunged and sank him. Then what do you think I did? I drank him. Faith, I thought him dead, not he. There he lives with tenfold glee, and now this moment with his wings I feel him tickling my heart-strings. Lee Hunt Cupid Stung Cupid once upon a bed of roses laid his weary head, luckless urchin not to see within the leaves a slumbering bee. The bee awaked, with anger wild, the bee awaked and stung the child. Loud and piteous are his cries, to Venus quick he runs, he flies. O oh, mother, I am wounded through, I die with pain, in sooth I do. Stung by some little angry thing, some serpent on a tiny wing, a bee it was, for once I know I heard a rustic call it so. Thus he spoke, and she the while heard him, with a soothing smile. Then said, My infant, if so much thou feel the little wild bee's touch, how must the heart, ah, Cupid, be, the hapless heart that's stung by thee? Thomas More Cupid and My Composby Cupid and my Composby played at cards for kisses. Cupid paid. He stakes his quiver, bow, and arrows, his mother's doves, and team of sparrows. Loses them, too, then down he throws the coral of his lips, the rose growing on his cheek, but none knows how. With them the crystal of his brow, and then the dimple of his chin. All these did my Composby win. At last he set her both his eyes. She won, and Cupid blind did rise. O oh, love, hath she done this to thee? What shall, alas, become of me? John Lyly A Ballad for a Boy Violo Roseboro, one of our good authors, brought to me a ballad for a boy, saying, I believe it is one of the poems that every child ought to know. It is included in this compilation out of respect to her opinion, and also because the boys to whom I have read it said it was great. The lesson in it is certainly fine. Men who are true men want to settle their own disputes by a hand-to-hand -hand fight, but they will always help each other when a third party or the elements interfere. Humanity is greater than human interests. When George the Third was reigning a hundred years ago, he ordered Captain Farmer to chase the foreign foe. "'You're not afraid of shot,' said he. "'You're not afraid of wreck. "'So cruise about the west of France, in the frigate called Quebec.' "'Quebec was once a Frenchman's town, but twenty years ago "'King George the Second sent a man called General Wolfe, you know, "'to clamber up a precipice and look into Quebec, "'as you'd look down a hatchway when standing on the deck.' If Wolfe could beat the Frenchmen then, so you can beat them now. Before he got inside the town he died, I must allow. But since the town was won for us, it is a lucky name, and you'll remember Wolfe's good work, and you shall do the same. Then Farmer said, I'll try, sir, and Farmer bowed so low that George could see his pigtail, tied in a velvet bow. George gave him his commission, and that it might be safer, signed, King of Britain, King of France, and sealed it with a wafer. Then proud was Captain Farmer in a frigate of his own, and grander on his quarter-deck than George upon his throne. He'd two guns in his cabin, and on the spar-deck ten, and twenty on the gun-deck, and more than ten score men. And as a huntsman scours the brakes with sixteen brace of dogs, with two and thirty cannon the ship explored the fogs. From Cape La Hogue to Ushant, from Roquefort to Belle Isle, she hunted game till reef and mud were rubbing on her keel. The fogs are dried, the frigate's side is bright with melting tar, the lad up in the foretop sees square white sails afar. The east wind drives three square-sailed masts from out the Breton Bay, and, "'Clear for action!' farmer shouts, and reefers yell, "'Hooray!' The Frenchman's captain had a name I wish I could pronounce. A Breton gentleman was he, and wholly free from bounce. 
one like those famous fellows who died by guillotine, for honour and the fleur de lis, and Antoinette the queen. The Catholic for Louis, the Protestant for George, each captain drew as bright a sword as saintly smiths could forge. And both were simple seamen, but both could understand how each was bound to win or die for flag and native land. The French ship was La Surveillante, which means the watchful maid. She folded up her headdress and began to cannonade. Her hull was clean and ours was foul. We had to spread more sail. On canvas stays and topsail yards her bullets came like hail. Sore smitten were both captains and many lads beside. And still to cut our rigging the foreign gunners tried. A sail-clad spar came flapping down athwart a blazing gun. We could not quench the rushing flames, and so the Frenchman won. Our quarter deck was crowded, the waist was all aglow. Men hung upon the taffrail, half scorched, but loath to go. Our captain sat where once he stood, and would not quit his chair. He bade his comrades leap for life and leave him bleeding there. The guns were hushed on either side, the Frenchmen lowered boats. They flung us planks and hen coops and everything that floats. They risked their lives, good fellows, to bring their rivals aid. Twas by the conflagration the peace was strangely made. La Surveillante was like a sieve. The victors had no rest. They had to dodge the east wind to reach the port of Brest. And where the waves leapt lower and the riddled ship went slower, in triumph, yet in funeral guise, came fisher boats to tow her. They dealt with us as brethren, they mourned for farmer dead, and as the wounded captives passed, each Breton bowed the head. Then spoke the French lieutenant, "'Twas fire that won, not we. You never struck your flag to us. You'll go to England free." "'Twas the sixth day of October, 1779, a year when nations ventured against us to combine. Quebec was burned and farmer slain, by us remembered not, but thanks be to the French book wherein they're not forgot. Now you, if you've to fight the French, my youngster, bear in mind, those seamen of King Louis so chivalrous and kind, think of the Breton gentlemen who took our lads to breast, and treat some rescued Breton as a comrade and a guest. End of section 58. Read by Kara Schallenberg on November 22, 2006, in Oceanside, California. Poems Every Child Should Know. Edited by Mary E. Burt. Section 59. Read for LibriVox.org by Kara Schallenberg. This section contains just one poem, The Skeleton in Armor. Part 5 continued. The Skeleton in Armor The Skeleton in Armor, by Longfellow, 1807-1882, to 1882, is a boy's poem. It is pure literature, and good history. Speak, speak, thou fearful guest, who, with thy hollow breast, Still in rude armour dressed, com'st to daunt me, Wrapped not in eastern balms, But with thy fleshless palms stretched, As if asking alms, Why dost thou haunt me? Then from those cavernous eyes Pale flashes seem to rise, As when the northern skies Gleam in December. And like the waters flow Under December's snow, Came a dull voice of woe From the heart's chamber. I was a Viking old, my deeds, though manifold, no skald in song has told, no saga taught thee. Take heed that in thy verse thou dost the tale rehearse, else dread a dead man's curse. For this I sought thee. Far in the northern land, by the wild Baltic strand, I with my childish hand tamed the Gare falcon and with my skates fast bound skimmed the half-frozen sound that the poor whimpering hound trembled to walk on. Oft to his frozen lair tracked I the grizzly bear, while from my path the hare fled like a shadow. Oft through the forest dark followed the werewolf's bark, until the soaring lark sang from the meadow. 
But when I older grew, joining a corsair's crew, O'er the dark sea I flew with the marauders. Wild was the life we led, many the souls that sped, Many the hearts that bled by our stern orders. Many a wassel bout wore the long winter out, Often our midnight shout set the cocks crowing, As we the berserk's tail measured in cups of ale, Draining the oaken pail filled to overflowing. Once, as I told in glee tales of the stormy sea, Soft eyes did gaze on me, burning yet tender. And as the white stars shine on the dark Norway pine, On that dark heart of mine fell their soft splendor. I wooed the blue-eyed maid, yielding yet half afraid, And in the forest's shade our vows were plighted. Under its loosened vest fluttered her little breast, like birds within their nest, by the hawk frighted. Bright in her father's hall, shields gleamed upon the wall, Loud sang the minstrels all, chanting his glory. When of old Hildebrand I asked his daughter's hand, Mute did the minstrel stand, to hear my story. While the brown ale he quaffed, loud then the champion laughed, And as the wind gusts waft the sea-foam brightly, so the loud laugh of scorn out of those lips unshorn, From the deep drinking horn blew the foam lightly. She was a prince's child, I but a viking wild, And though she blushed and smiled, I was discarded. Should not the dove so white follow the sea-mew's flight? Why did they leave that night her nest unguarded? Scarce had I put to sea, bearing the maid with me, Fairest of all was she among the Norsemen. When on the white sea strand, waving his armed hand, Saw we old Hildebrand with twenty horsemen. Then launched they to the blast, bent like a reed each mast, Yet we were gaining fast, when the wind failed us, And with a sudden flaw came round the gusty scaw, So that our foe we saw laugh as he hailed us. And as to catch the gale, round veered the flapping sail, Death was the helmsman's hail, death without quarter. Midships with iron keel struck we her ribs of steel, Down her black hulk did reel through the black water. As with his wings aslant sails the fierce cormorant, Seeking some rocky haunt, with his prey laden, So toward the open main, beating to sea again, Through the wild hurricane, bore I the maiden. Three weeks we westward bore, and when the storm was o'er, Cloud-like we saw the shore stretching to leeward. There, for my lady's bower, built I the lofty tower, Which to this very hour stands looking seaward. There lived we many years. Time dried the maiden's tears. She had forgot her fears. She was a mother. Death closed her mild blue eyes. Under that tower she lies. Ne'er shall the sun arise on such another. Still grew my bosom then, still as a stagnant fen, Hateful to me were men, the sunlight hateful. In the vast forest here, clad in my warlike gear, Fell I upon my spear, O oh, death was grateful. Thus seemed with many scars, bursting these prison bars, up to its native stars my soul ascended. There from the flowing bowl deep drinks the warrior's soul. Skoll to the Northland, skoll! Thus the tale ended. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow End of section 59 Read by Kara Schallenberg on December 30th, 2006 in Oceanside, California. Poems Every Child Should Know, edited by Mary E. Burt. Section 60, read for LibriVox.org by Kara Schallenberg. This section contains just one poem, The Revenge, a ballad of the fleet. Part 5 continued. The Revenge, a ballad of the fleet. 
Tennyson's The Revenge finds a welcome here because it is a favorite with teachers of elocution and their audiences. It teaches us to hold life cheap when the nation's safety is at stake. At Flores in the Azores, Sir Richard Grenville lay, and a pinnace like a fluttered bird came flying from away. Spanish ships of war at sea, we have sighted fifty-three. Then swear Lord Thomas Howard, For God, I am no coward, but I cannot meet them here, for my ships are out of gear, and the half my men are sick, I must fly, but follow quick. We are six ships of the line, can we fight with fifty-three? Then spake Sir Richard Grenville, I know you are no coward, you fly them for a moment, to fight with them again. But I've ninety men and more that are lying sick ashore, I should count myself the coward if I left them, my lord Howard, to these inquisition dogs and the deviledoms of Spain. So lord Howard passed away with five ships of war that day, till he melted like a cloud in the silent summer heaven. But Sir Richard bore in hand all his sick men from the land, very carefully and slow, men of Bidford in Devon, and we laid them on the ballast down below, for we brought them all aboard, and they blessed him in their pain that they were not left to Spain, to the thumbscrew and the stake, for the glory of the Lord. He had only a hundred seamen to work the ship and to fight, and he sailed away from Flores till the Spaniard came in sight, with his huge sea-castles heaving upon the weather-bow. Shall we fight, or shall we fly? Good Sir Richard, tell us now, for to fight is but to die. There'll be little of us left by the time this sun be set, and Sir Richard said again, We be all good Englishmen, let us bang these dogs of Seville, the children of the devil, for I never turned my back upon Don or devil yet. Sir Richard spoke, and he laughed, and we roared a hurrah, and so the little revenge ran on sheer into the heart of the foe, with her hundred fighters on deck and her ninety sick below, for half of their fleet to the right and half to the left were seen, and the little revenge ran on through the long sea-lane between. Thousands of their soldiers looked down from their decks and laughed, Thousands of their seamen made mock at the mad little craft, running on and on till delayed by their mountain like Saint Philippe, that of fifteen hundred tons and upshadowing high above us with her yawning tiers of guns, took the breath from our sails, and we stayed. And while now the great San Philip hung above us like a cloud, whence the thunderbolt will fall, long and loud, Four galleons drew away from the Spanish fleet that day, and two upon the larboard and two upon the starboard lay, and the battle thunder broke from them all. But anon the great San Philip she bethought herself and went, having that within her womb that had left her ill content, and the rest they came aboard us, and they fought us hand to hand, for a dozen times they came with their pikes and musketeers, and a dozen times we shook them off, as a dog that shakes his ears when he leaps from the water to the land. And the sun went down, and the stars came out far over the summer sea, but never a moment ceased the fight of the one and the fifty-three. Ship after ship, the whole night long, their high-built galleons came. Ship after ship, the whole night long, with her battle, thunder, and flame. Ship after ship, the whole night long, drew back with her dead and her shame, for some were sunk, and many were shattered, and so could fight us no more. God of battles, was ever a battle like this in the world before? For he said, Fight on, fight on, though his vessel was all but a wreck, and it chanced that, when half of the short summer night was gone, with a grisly wound to be dressed, he had left the deck, but a bullet struck him that was dressing it suddenly dead, and himself he was wounded again in the side and the head. And he said, Fight on, fight on. And the night went down, and the sun smiled out far over the summer sea, and the Spanish fleet with broken sides lay round us all in a ring, but they dared not touch us again, for they feared that we still could sting. 
so they watched what the end would be. And we had not fought them in vain, but in perilous plight were we, seeing forty of our poor hundred were slain, and half of the rest of us maimed for life in the crash of the cannonades and the desperate strife. And the sick men down in the hold were most of them stark and cold, and the pikes were all broken or bent, and the powder was all of it spent, and the masts and the rigging were lying over the side. But Sir Richard cried in his English pride, We have fought such a fight for a day and a night as may never be fought again. We have won great glory, my men, and a day less or more at sea or ashore. We die. Does it matter when? Sink me into the ship, Master Gunner, sink her, split her in twain. Fall into the hands of God, not into the hands of Spain. And the gunner said, Ay, ay. But the seamen made reply, We have children, we have wives, and the Lord hath spared our lives. We will make the Spaniard promise, if we yield, to let us go. We shall live to fight again, and to strike another blow. And the lion lay there dying, and they yielded to the foe. And the stately Spanish men to their flagship bore him then, where they laid him by the mast, old Sir Richard caught at last, and they praised him to his face with their courtly foreign grace. But he rose upon their decks, and he cried, I have fought for queen and faith like a valiant man and true. I have only done my duty as a man is bound to do. With a joyful spirit I, Sir Richard Grenville, die. And he fell upon their decks, and he died. And they stared at the dead that had been so valiant and true, and had holden the power and glory of Spain so cheap, that he dared her with one little ship and his English few. Was he devil or man? He was devil for aught they knew, but they sank his body with honour down into the deep, and they manned the revenge with a swarthier alien crew, and away she sailed with her loss and longed for her own. When a wind from the land they had ruined awoke from sleep, and the water began to heave and the weather to moan. And ere ever that evening ended a great gale blew, and a wave like the wave that is raised by an earthquake grew, till it smote on their hulls and their sails and their masts and their flags, and the whole sea plunged and fell on the shot-shattered navy of Spain, and the little revenge herself went down by the island crags, to be lost evermore in the main. Alfred Tennyson End of section 60 Read by Kara Schallenberg www.kray.org On January 7, 2007 In Oceanside, California Poems Every Child Should Know Edited by Mary E. Burt Section 61 Read for LibriVox.org by Kara Schallenberg. This section contains just two poems, Sir Galahad and A Name in the Sand. Part 5 continued. Sir Galahad Sir Galahad is the most moral and upright of all the knights of the round table. The strong lines of the poem are the strong lines of human destiny. My good blade carves the casks of men, my tough lance thrusteth sure. My strength is as the strength of ten, because my heart is pure. The shattering trumpet shrilleth high, the hard brands shiver on the steel. The splintered spear-shafts crack and fly, the horse and rider reel. They reel, they roll in clanging lists, and when the tide of combat stands, Perfume and flowers fall in showers that lightly rain from ladies' hands. How sweet are looks that ladies bend on whom their favours fall! For them I battle till the end to save from shame and thrall. But all my heart is drawn above, my knees are bowed in crypt and shrine. I never felt the kiss of love, nor maiden's hand in mine. More bounteous aspects on me beam, me mightier transports move and thrill, So keep I fair through faith and prayer A virgin heart in work and will. 
When down the stormy crescent goes, a light before me swims, between dark stems the forest glows, I hear a noise of hymns. Then by some secret shrine I ride, I hear a voice, but none are there. The stalls are void, the doors are wide, the tapers burning fair. Fair gleams the snowy altar cloth, the silver vessels sparkle clean, the shrill bell rings, the censer swings, and solemn chants resound between. Sometimes on lonely mountain mirrors I find a magic bark. I leap on board, no helmsman steers, I float, till all is dark. A gentle sound, an awful light, three angels bear the holy grail, with folded feet in stoles of white, on sleeping wings they sail. Ah, blessed vision, blood of God, my spirit beats her mortal bars, as down dark tides the glory slides, and star-like mingles with the stars. When on my goodly charger borne through dreaming towns I go, the cock crows ere the Christmas morn, the streets are dumb with snow. The tempest crackles on the leads, and ringing springs from brand and mail, but o'er the dark a glory spreads, and gilds the driving hail. I leave the plain, I climb the height, no branchy thicket shelter yields. But blessed forms in whistling storms fly o'er waste fens and windy fields. A maiden night, to me is given such hope I know not fear. I yearn to breathe the airs of heaven that often meet me here. I muse on joy that will not cease, pure spaces clothed in living beams, pure lilies of eternal peace, whose odours haunt my dreams. And stricken by an angel's hand, this mortal armour that I wear, this weight and size, this heart and eyes, are touched, are turned to finest air. The clouds are broken in the sky, and through the mountain walls a rolling organ harmony swells up and shakes and falls. Then move the trees, the copses nod, wings flutter, voices hover clear. O just and faithful knight of God, ride on, the prize is near. So pass I hostel, hall, and grange, by bridge and ford, by park and pale, all armed I ride, whate'er betide, until I find the Holy Grail. Alfred Tennyson A Name in the Sand A Name in the Sand by Hannah Flagg Gould, 1789-1865, is a poem to correct our ready overestimate of our own importance. Alone I walked the ocean strand, a pearly shell was in my hand. I stooped and wrote upon the sand my name, the year, the day. As onward from the spot I passed, one lingering look behind I cast. A wave came rolling high and fast, and washed my lines away. And so, methought, twill shortly be, with every mark on earth from me, a wave of dark oblivion sea will sweep across the place where I have trod the sandy shore of time and been to be no more of me, my day, the name I bore, to leave nor track nor trace. And yet, with him who counts the sands and holds the waters in his hands, I know a lasting record stands inscribed against my name. Of all this mortal part has wrought, of all this thinking soul has thought, and from these fleeting moments caught for glory or for shame. Hannah Flagg Gould End of section 61 Read by Kara Schallenberg on January 7, 2007 in Oceanside, California Poems Every Child Should Know Edited by Mary E. Burt Section 62 Read for LibriVox.org by Kara Schallenberg This section contains the following poems. The Voice of Spring And The Forsaken Merman Part 6 Grow old along with me, 
the best is yet to be, the last of life, for which the first was made. THE VOICE OF SPRING The Voice of Spring by Felicia Hammonds, 1749-1835, becomes attractive as years go on. The line in this poem that captivated my youthful fancy was, The larch has hung all his tassels forth. The delight with which trees hang out their new little tassels every year is one of the charms of the pine family. John Burroughs sent us down a tiny hemlock that grew in our window-box at school for five years, and every spring it was a new joy on account of the fine, tender tassels. Mrs. Hemans has a vivid imagination, backed up by an abundant information. I come, I come, ye have called me long, I come o'er the mountains with light and song. Ye may trace my step o'er the waking earth, by the winds which tell of the violet's birth, by the primrose stars in the shadowy grass, by the green leaves opening as I pass. I have breathed on the south, and the chestnut flowers by thousands have burst from the forest bowers, and the ancient graves and the fallen fanes are veiled with wreaths on Italian plains. But it is not for me in my hour of bloom to speak of the ruin or the tomb. I have looked o'er the hills of the stormy north, and the larch has hung all his tassels forth. The fisher is out on the sunny sea, and the reindeer bounds o'er the pastures free, and the pine has a fringe of softer green, and the moss looks bright where my step has been. I have sent through the wood-paths a glowing sigh, and called out each voice of the deep blue sky. From the night-birds lay, through the starry time, In the groves of the soft Hesperian clime, To the swan's wild note by the Iceland lakes, When the dark fir-branch into verdure breaks. From the streams and founts I have loosed the chain, They are sweeping on to the silvery main, They are flashing down from the mountain brows, They are flinging spray o'er the forest boughs, they are bursting fresh from their sparry caves, and the earth resounds with the joy of waves. Felicia Hammonds The Forsaken Merman The Forsaken Merman by Matthew Arnold, 1822-1888, is a poem that I do not expect children to appreciate fully, even when they care enough for it to learn it. It is too long for most children to commit to memory, and I generally assign one stanza to one pupil, and another to another pupil, until it is divided up among them. The poem is a masterpiece. Doubtless the poet meant to show that the forsaken merman had a greater soul to save than the woman who sought to save her soul by deserting natural duty. Salvation does not come through the faith that builds itself at the expense of love. Come, dear children, let us away, down and away below. Now my brothers call from the bay, now the great winds shoreward blow, now the salt tides seaward flow, now the wild white horses play, champ and chafe and toss in the spray. Children, dear, let us away. This way, this way. Call her once before you go, Call once yet, In a voice that she will know. Margaret, Margaret! Children's voices should be dear, Call once more, to a mother's ear. Children's voices, wild with pain, Surely she will come again. Call her once, and come away, This way, this way. Mother dear, we cannot stay, the wild white horses foam and fret. Margaret, Margaret! Come, dear children, come away down, call no more. One last look at the white-walled town, And the little grey church on the windy shore. Then come down. She will not come, though you call all day. Come away, come away. Children dear, was it yesterday We heard the sweet bells over the bay? In the caverns where we lay, Through the surf and through the swell, 
the far-off sound of a silver bell? Sand-strewn caverns cool and deep, where the winds are all asleep, where the spent lights quiver and gleam, where the salt weed sways in the stream, where the sea-beasts, ranged all round, feed in the ooze of their pasture-ground, where the sea-snakes coil and twine, dry their mail and bask in the brine, where great whales come sailing by, sail and sail, with unshut eye, round the world for ever and aye, when did music come this way? Children, dear, was it yesterday? Children, dear, was it yesterday? Call yet once, that she went away? Once she sat with you and me, On a red-gold throne in the heart of the sea, And the youngest sat on her knee. She combed its bright hair, and she tended it well, When down swung the sound of a far-off bell. She sighed, she looked up through the clear green sea. She said, I must go, for my kinsfolk pray in the little grey church on the shore to-day. T'will be Easter time in the world. Ah, me! And I lose my poor soul, merman, here with thee. I said, Go up, dear heart, through the waves, say thy prayer, and come back to the kind sea-caves. She smiled. She went up through the surf in the bay. Children dear, was it yesterday? Children dear, were we long alone? The sea grows stormy, the little ones moan. Long prayers, I said, in the world they say. Come, I said, and we rose through the surf in the bay. We went up the beach by the sandy down, where the sea stalks bloom to the white walled town. Through the narrow paved streets, where all was still, to the little grey church on the windy hill. From the church came a murmur of folk at their prayers, but we stood without, in the cold blowing airs. We climbed on the graves, on the stones worn with rains, and we gazed up the aisle through the small leaded panes. She sat by the pillar. We saw her clear. Margaret, hist, come quick, we are here. Dear heart, I said, we are long alone. The sea grows stormy, the little ones moan. But, ah, she gave me never a look, For her eyes were sealed to the holy book. Loud prays the priest, Shut stands the door. Come away, children, call no more. Come away, come down, call no more. Down, 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 down to the depths of the sea, She sits at her wheel in the humming town, Singing most joyfully. Hark what she sings, O oh joy, O oh joy, for the humming street, and the child with its toy, for the priest, and the bell, and the holy well, for the wheel where I spun, and the blessed light of the sun. And so she sings her fill, singing most joyfully, till the spindle drops from her hand, and the whizzing wheel stands still. She steals to the window, and looks at the sand, and over the sand at the sea, and her eyes are set in a stare, and anon there breaks a sigh, and anon there drops a tear from a sorrow-clouded eye, and a heart sorrow-laden, a long, long sigh, for the cold, strange eyes of a little mermaiden, and the gleam of her golden hair. Come away, away, children, come, children, come down, the hoarse wind blows colder, light shine in the town, she will start from her slumber when gusts shake the door. She will hear the winds howling, will hear the waves roar. We shall see, while above us the waves roar and whirl, a ceiling of amber, a pavement of pearl. Singing, Here came a mortal, but faithless was she, and alone dwell for ever the kings of the sea. But children, at midnight, when soft the winds blow, when clear falls the moonlight, when spring tides are low, when sweet airs come seaward from heaths starred with broom, And high rocks throw mildly on the blanched sands a gloom, Up the still glistening beaches, up the creeks we will hie, Over banks of bright seaweed the ebb-tide leaves dry, We will gaze from the sand-hills at the white sleeping town, At the church on the hillside, and then come back down, Singing, 
There dwells a loved one, but cruel is she. She left lonely for ever the kings of the sea. Matthew Arnold End of section 62 Read by Kara Schallenberg on January 7, 2007 In Oceanside, California Poems Every Child Should Know Edited by Mary E. Burt Section 63 Read for LibriVox.org by Kara Schallenberg this section contains the following poems. The Banks Odoon, The Light of Other Days, and My Own Shall Come to Me. Part 6 continued. The Banks Odoon. The Banks Odoon by Robert Burns, 1759 to 1796. Bonnie Doon is in the southwestern part of Scotland. Robert Burns's old home is close to it. The house has low walls, a thatched roof, and only two rooms. Alloway Kirk and the two bridges so famous in Robert Burns' verse are nearby. This is an enchanted land, and the Scotch people for miles around air speak of the poet with sincere affection. Burns, more than any other poet, has thrown the enchantment of poetry over his own locality. Ye banks and braes, O bonny doon, how can ye bloom so fair? How can ye chant, ye little birds, and eyes so full o' care? Thou'lt break my heart, thou bonny bird, that sings upon the bough. Thou minds me o' the happy days, when my false love was true. Thou'lt break my heart, thou bonny bird, that sings beside thy mate. For say I sat, and say I sang, and wist now my fate. Aft hae I roved by bonny doon to see the woodbine twine, and ilk a bird sang o' its love, and say did I o' mine. Wi' lightsome heart I pulled a rose fra off its thorny tree, and my false lover staw the rose, but left the thorn wi' me. Robert Burns. The Light of Other Days. Oft in the stilly night, ere slumber's chain has bound me, Fond memory brings the light of other days around me. The smiles, the tears of boyhood's years, The words of love then spoken, The eyes that shone, now dimmed and gone, The cheerful hearts now broken. Thus in the stilly night, ere slumber's chain has bound me, Sad memory brings the light of other days around me. When I remember all the friends so linked together, I've seen around me fall like leaves in wintry weather. I feel like one who treads alone some banquet hall deserted, whose lights are fled, whose garlands dead, and all but he departed. Thus in the stilly night, ere slumber's chain has bound me, sad memory brings the light of other days around me. Thomas Moore my own shall come to me. If John Burroughs had never written any other poem than My Own Shall Come to Me, he would have stood to all ages as one of the greatest of American poets. The poem is most characteristic of the tall, majestic, slow-going poet and naturalist. There is no greater line in Greek or English literature than I stand amid the eternal ways. Serene I fold my hands and wait, nor care for wind, nor tide, nor sea. I rave no more against time or fate, for lo, my own shall come to me. I stay my haste, I make delays, for what avails this eager pace? I stand amid the eternal ways, and what is mine shall know my face. Asleep awake, by night or day, the friends I seek are seeking me. No wind can drive my bark astray, nor change the tide of destiny. What matter if I stand alone? I wait with joy the coming years. My heart shall reap when it has sown, and gather up its fruit of tears. The stars come nightly to the sky, the tidal wave comes to the sea, nor time, nor space, nor deep, nor high can keep my own away from me. 
the waters know their own and draw the brook that springs in yonder heights so flows the good with equal law unto the soul of pure delights john burroughs end of section sixty three read by kara schallenberg on january ninth two thousand seven in oceanside california Poems Every Child Should Know Edited by Mary E. Burt Section 64 Read for LibriVox.org by Kara Schallenberg This section contains two poems, Ode to a Skylark and The Sands of D. Part 6 Continued Ode to a Skylark Ode to a Skylark by Percy Bysshe Shelley, 1792-1822, is usually assigned to grammar grades of schools. It is included here out of respect to a boy of eleven years, who was more impressed with these lines than with any other lines in any poem. Hail to thee, blithe spirit, bird thou never wert, that from heaven or near it pourest thy full heart in profuse strains of unpremeditated art. Higher still and higher from the earth thou springest, like a cloud of fire the blue deep thou wingest, and singing still dost soar and soaring ever singest. In the golden lightning of the sunken sun, o'er which clouds are brightening, thou dost float and run like an unbodied joy whose race is just begun. The pale purple even melts around thy flight, like a star of heaven in the broad daylight. Thou art unseen, but yet I hear thy shrill delight. All the earth and air with thy voice is loud, as when night is bare from one lonely cloud the moon rains out her beams, and heaven is overflowed. What thou art we know not, what is most like thee? From rainbow clouds there flow not drops so bright to see As from thy presence showers a rain of melody. Like a poet hidden in the light of thought, Singing hymns unbidden till the world is wrought To sympathy with hopes and fears it heeded not. Teach us, sprite or bird, what sweet thoughts are thine, I have never heard praise of love or wine That panted forth a flood of rapture so divine. Chorus hymeneal or triumphal chant, Matched with thine, would be all but an empty vaunt, A thing wherein we feel there is some hidden want. What objects are the fountains of thy happy strain? What fields or waves or mountains? What shapes of sky or plain? What love of thine own kind, what ignorance of pain? Teach me half the gladness that thy brain must know, Such harmonious madness from my lips would flow, The world should listen then, as I am listening now. Percy Bysshe Shelley The Sand is of D. I have often had the pleasure of riding across the coast from Chester, England, to Rill, on the north coast of Wales, where stretch the sands of Dee. These purple sands at low tide stretch off into the sea miles away, and are said to be full of quicksands. O oh, Mary, go and call the cattle home, and call the cattle home, and call the cattle home across the sands of Dee. The western wind was wild and dark with foam, and all alone went she. The western tide crept up along the sand, and o'er and o'er the sand, and round and round the sand, as far as I could see. The rolling mist came down, and hid the land, and never home came she. Oh, is it weed, or fish, or floating hair, a tress of golden hair, a drowned maiden's hair, above the nets at sea? Was never salmon yet that shone so fair Among the stakes on Dee. They rowed her in across the rolling foam, The cruel crawling foam, The cruel hungry foam, To her grave beside the sea. 
but still the boatmen hear her call the cattle home across the sands of Dee. Charles Kingsley. End of section sixty four. Read by Kara Schallenberg on January ninth, two thousand seven, in Oceanside, California. Poems Every Child Should Know. Edited by Mary E. Burt. Section 65. Read for LibriVox.org by Kara Schallenberg. This section contains the following poems. A Wish. Lucy. Solitude. John Anderson. And The God of Music. Part 6. Continued. A Wish. A Wish by Samuel Rogers, 1763 to 1855, and Lucy, by Wordsworth, 1770 to 1850, are two gems that can be valued only for the spirit of quiet and modesty diffused by them. Mine be a cot beside the hill, a beehive's hum shall soothe my ear, a willowy brook that turns a mill with many a fall shall linger near. The swallow oft beneath my thatch Shall twitter from her clay-built nest. Oft shall the pilgrim lift the latch And share my meal, a welcome guest. Around my ivied porch shall spring Each fragrant flower that drinks the dew, And Lucy at her wheel shall sing In russet gown and apron blue. The village church among the trees, Where first our marriage vows were given, with merry peals shall swell the breeze, And point with taper spire to heaven. S. Rogers Lucy She dwelt among the untrodden ways, Beside the springs of dove, A maid whom there were none to praise, And very few to love. A violet by a mossy stone, Half hidden from the eye, Fair as a star when only one is shining in the sky. She lived unknown, and few could know when Lucy ceased to be. But she is in her grave, and, oh, the difference to me! William Wordsworth Solitude Happy the man whose wish and care a few paternal acres bound, Content to breathe his native air In his own ground. Whose herds with milk, Whose fields with bread, Whose flocks supply him with attire, Whose trees in summer yield him shade, In winter fire. Blessed who can unconcernedly find Hours, days, and years slide soft away, In health of body, peace of mind, Quiet by day. Sound sleep by night, study and ease, together mixed, sweet recreation, and innocence, which most does please, with meditation. Thus let me live, unseen, unknown, thus unlamented let me die, steal from the world, and not a stone, tell where I lie. Alexander Pope John Anderson John Anderson by Robert Burns, 1759 to 1796. This poem is included to please several teachers. John Anderson, my Joe, John, when we were first acquaint, your locks were like the raven, your bonny brow was brent. But now your brow is bald, John, your locks are like the snow, but blessings on your frosty pow, John Anderson, my Joe. John Anderson, my Joe, John, we clam the hill together, and money a canty day, John, we've had we on a nither. Now we maun totter down, John, but hand in hand we'll go, and sleep together at the foot, John Anderson, my Joe. Robert Burns The God of Music The God of Music by Edith M. Thomas, an Ohio poetess now living. In this sonnet the poetess has touched the power of Wordsworth, or Keats, 
and placed herself among the immortals. The god of music dwelleth out of doors. All seasons through his minstrelsy we meet, breathing by field and covert haunting sweet, from organ lofts in forests old he pours, a solemn harmony, on leafy floors to smooth autumnal pipes he moves his feet, or with the tingling plectrum of the sleet in winter keen beats out his thrilling scores. Leave me the reed unplucked beside the stream, and he will stoop and fill it with the breeze. Leave me the vial's frame in secret trees, unwrought, and it shall wake a druid theme. Leave me the whispering shell on narrowed shores. The god of music dwelleth out of doors. Edith M. Thomas End of section 65 Read by Kara Schallenberg on January 9, 2007 In Oceanside, California Poems Every Child Should Know Edited by Mary E. Burt Section 66 Read for LibriVox.org by Kara Schallenberg This section contains two poems, A Musical Instrument and The Brides of Enderby. Part 6 Continued A Musical Instrument A Musical Instrument by Elizabeth Barrett Browning, 1806-1861 this poem is the supreme masterpiece of Mrs. Browning. The prime thought in it is the sacrifice and pain that must go to make a poet of any genius. What was he doing, the great god Pan, down in the reeds by the river, spreading ruin and scattering ban, splashing and paddling with hoofs of a goat, and breaking the golden lilies afloat with the dragonfly on the river? He tore out a reed, the great god Pan, from the deep cool bed of the river. The limpid water turbidly ran, and the broken lilies a-dying lay, and the dragonfly had fled away ere he brought it out of the river. High on the shore sat the great god Pan, while turbidly flowed the river, and hacked and hewed as a great god can with his hard bleak steel at the patient reed, till there was not a sign of a leaf indeed to prove it fresh from the river. He cut it short, did the great god Pan, how tall it stood in the river, then drew the pith, like the heart of a man, steadily from the outside ring, and notched the poor dry empty thing in holes, as he sat by the river. This is the way, laughed the great god Pan, laughed while he sat by the river. The only way, since gods began, to make sweet music, they could succeed. Then, dropping his mouth to a hole in the reed, he blew in power by the river. Sweet, 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 O Pan, piercing sweet by the river. Blinding sweet, O great god Pan, the sun on the hill forgot to die, and the lilies revived, and the dragonfly came back to dream on the river. Yet half a beast is the great god Pan, to laugh as he sits by the river. Making a poet out of a man, the true gods sigh for the cost and pain, for the reed which grows never more again, as a reed with the reeds in the river. Elizabeth Barrett Browning The Brides of Enderby The Brides of Enderby by Jean Ingelow, 1830-1897 this poem is very dramatic, and the music of the refrain has done much to make it popular. But the pathos is that which endears it. The old mayor climbed the belfry tower, the ringers ran by two by three. Pull, if ye never pulled before, good ringers, pull your best, quoth he. Play up, play up, O Boston bells, ply all your changes, all your swells, play up, the brides of Enderby. Men say it was a stolen tide, the Lord that sent it, he knows all, but in mine ears doth still abide the message that the bells let fall. And there was naught of strange beside the flight of mews and pewits pied by millions crouched on the old sea wall. 
I sat and spun within the door, my thread break off, I raised mine eyes, the level sun like ruddy oar lay sinking in the barren skies, and dark against day's golden death she moved where Lindus wandereth, my son's fair wife, Elizabeth. Cusha, 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 calling, ere the early dews were falling, far away I heard her song, Cusha, Cusha, all along, where the reedy Lindus floweth, 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 from the meads where Melick groweth, faintly came her milking song. Cusha, 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 calling, for the dews will soon be falling, leave your meadow grasses mellow, 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 quit your cowslips, cowslips yellow, come up white foot, come up light foot, quit the stalks of parsley hollow, 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 come up jetty, rise and follow, from the clovers lift your head, come up white foot, come up light foot, come up jetty, rise and follow jetty, to the milking shed. If it be long, I long ago, when I begin to think how long, Again I hear the lindus flow, swift as an arrow, sharp and strong, And all the air, it seemeth me, been full of floating bells, saith she, That ring the tune of Enderby. All fresh the level pasture lay, and not a shadow mote be seen, Save where full five good miles away the steeple towered from out the green, And lo, the great bell far and wide was heard in all the countryside, That Saturday, at eventide. The swan-herds, where their sedges are, moved on in sunset's golden breath. The shepherd lads I heard afar, and my son's wife, Elizabeth, till floating o'er the grassy sea, came down that kindly message free, the brides of Mavis Enderby. Then some looked up into the sky, and all along where Lindus flows, to where the goodly vessels lie, and where the lordly steeple shows. They said, and why should this thing be? What danger lowers by land or sea? They ring the tune of Enderby. For evil news from Mablethorpe, Of pirate galleys warping down, For ships ashore beyond the scorp, They have not spared to wake the town. But while the west been red to see, And storms be none, and pirates flee, Why ring the brides of Enderby? I looked without, and lo, my son came riding down With might and main, he raised a shout as he drew on, till all the welkin rang again. Elizabeth, Elizabeth! A sweeter woman ne'er drew breath than my son's wife, Elizabeth. The old sea wall, he cried, is down, the rising tide comes on apace, and boats adrift in yonder town go sailing up the market-place. He shook as one that looks on death. God save you, mother, straight he saith, where is my wife Elizabeth? Good son, where Lindus winds her way, With her two bairns I marked her long, And ere yon bells began to play, Afar I heard her milking song. He looked across the grassy lea, To right, to left. Ho, Enderby! They rang, the brides of Enderby. With that he cried and beat his breast, For lo, along the river's bed, A mighty eiger reared his crest, and up the lindus raging sped, It swept with thunderous noises loud, Shaped like a curling snow-white cloud, Or like a demon in a shroud, And rearing lindus backward pressed, Shook all her trembling banks amain, Then madly at the eiger's breast Flung up her weltering walls again, Then banks came down with ruin and rout, Then beaten foam flew round about, Then all the mighty floods were out. So far, so fast the eiger drave, The heart had barely time to beat, Before a shallow, seething wave Sobbed in the grasses at our feet. The feet had hardly time to flee, Before it break against the knee, And all the world was in the sea. Upon the roof we sat that night, The noise of bells went sweeping by. I marked the lofty beacon light Stream from the church-tower, red and high, A lurid mark and dread to see, and awesome bells they were to me, That in the dark rang Enderby. They rang the sailor-lads to guide From roof to roof who fearless rode, And I, 
My son was at my side, and yet the ruddy beacon glowed, and yet he moaned beneath his breath, O oh, come in life or come in death, O oh, lost my love, Elizabeth! And didst thou visit him no more? Thou didst, thou didst, my daughter dear. The waters laid thee at his door, ere yet the early dawn was clear. Thy pretty bairns in fast embrace, the lifted sun shone on thy face, down drifted to thy dwelling place. That flow strewed wrecks about the grass, that ebb swept out the flocks to sea, a fatal ebb and flow, alas, to many more than mine and me, but each will mourn his own, she saith, and sweeter woman ne'er drew breath than my son's wife, Elizabeth. I shall never hear her more by the reedy Lindis shore, Cusha, Cusha, Cusha calling, ere the early dews be falling. I shall never hear her song, Cusha, Cusha, all along, where the sunny Lindis floweth, goeth, floweth, from the meads where Melick groweth, when the water winding down, onward floweth to the town. I shall never see her more where the reeds and rushes quiver, Shiver, quiver, stand beside the sobbing river, Sobbing, throbbing in its falling, To the sandy lonesome shore, I shall never hear her calling, Leave your meadow grasses mellow, 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 Quit your cowslips, cowslips yellow. Come up, white foot, come up, light foot, Quit your pipes of parsley hollow, hollow, hollow. Come up, light foot, rise and follow, light foot, white foot, From your clovers lift the head, Come up, Jetty, follow, follow, Jetty, to the milking shed. Jean Ingelow. End of section sixty six. Read by Kara Schallenberg on January twelfth, two thousand seven, in Oceanside, California. Poems Every Child Should Know. Edited by Mary E. Burt. Section 67. Read for LibriVox.org by Kara Schallenberg. This section contains two poems, The Lie and L'Envoy. Part 6 continued. The Lie. The Lie by Sir Walter Raleigh, 1552-1618, is one of the strongest and most appealing poems a teacher can read to her pupils when teaching early American history. The poem is full of magnificent lines, such as, Go, soul, the body's guest. The poem never lacks an attentive audience of young people when correlated with the study of North Carolina and Sir Walter Raleigh. The solitary majestic character of Sir Walter Raleigh, his intrepidity while undergoing tortures inflicted by a cowardly king, the ring of indignation, all these make a weapon for him stronger than the axe that beheaded him. In this poem, he has the last word. Go, soul, the body's guest, upon a thankless errand. Fear not to touch the best. The truth shall be thy warrant. Go, since I needs must die, and give the world the lie. Go tell the court it glows and shines like rotten wood. Go tell the church it shows what's good and doth no good. If church and court reply, then give them both the lie. Tell potentates they live, acting by others' actions, Not loved unless they give, Not strong but by their factions. If potentates reply, give potentates the lie. Tell men of high condition that rule affairs of state, Their purpose is ambition, their practice only hate. And if they once reply, then give them all the lie. Tell zeal it lacks devotion, tell love it is but lust, Tell time it is but motion, tell flesh it is but dust, And wish them not reply, for thou must give the lie. Tell wit how much it wrangles in tickle-points of niceness, Tell wisdom she entangles herself in over-wiseness, And if they do reply, straight give them both the lie. Tell physic of her boldness, tell skill it is pretension, Tell charity of coldness, tell law it is contention, And as they yield reply, so give them still the lie. Tell fortune of her blindness, tell nature of decay, 
tell friendship of unkindness, tell justice of delay, and if they dare reply, then give them all the lie. Tell arts they have no soundness, but vary by esteeming, tell schools they want profoundness, and stand too much on seeming. If arts and schools reply, give arts and schools the lie. So when thou hast, as I, commanded thee, done blabbing, although to give the lie deserves no less than stabbing, yet stab at thee who will, no stab the soul can kill. Sir Walter Raleigh L'envoy L'envoy, by Rudyard Kipling, is a favourite on account of its sweeping assertion of the individual's right to self-development. When earth's last picture is painted, and the tubes are twisted and dried, when the oldest colours have faded, and the youngest critic has died, we shall rest, and, faith, we shall need it, lie down for an eon or two, till the master of all good workmen shall set us to work anew. And those who were good shall be happy, they shall sit in a golden chair, they shall splash at a ten-league canvas with brushes of comet's hair. They shall find real saints to draw from, Magdalene, Peter, and Paul. They shall work for an age at a sitting, and never be tired at all. And only the Master shall praise us, and only the Master shall blame. And no one shall work for money, and no one shall work for fame. But each for the joy of the working, and each in his separate star, shall draw the thing as he sees it, for the God of things as they are. Rudyard Kipling End of section 67 Read by Kara Schallenberg on January 12, 2007 in Oceanside, California. Poems Every Child Should Know Edited by Mary E. Burt Section 68 Read for LibriVox.org by Kara Schallenberg This section contains the following poems. Contentment The Harp That Once Through Tara's Halls And The Old Oaken Bucket Part 6 Continued Contentment Contentment by Edward Dyer, 1545-1607 This poem holds much to comfort and control people who are shut up to the joys of meditation, people to whom the world of activity is closed. To be independent of things material, this is the soul's pleasure. My mind to me a kingdom is, such perfect joy therein I find, as far excels all earthly bliss that God or nature hath assigned. Though much I want that most would have, yet still my mind forbids to crave. Content I live, this is my stay, I seek no more than may suffice. I press to bear no haughty sway, look, what I lack my mind supplies. Lo, thus I triumph like a king, content with that my mind doth bring. I laugh not at another's loss, I grudge not at another's gain, no worldly wave my mind can toss, I brook that is another's bane. I fear no foe, nor fawn on friend, I loathe not life, nor dread mine end. My wealth is health and perfect ease, my conscience clear my chief defence, I never seek by bribes to please, nor by desert to give offence. Thus do I live, thus will I die, would all did so as well as I. Edward Dyer The Harp That Once Through Tara's Halls The harp that once through Tara's halls the soul of music shed, now hangs as mute on Tara's walls, as if that soul were fled. So sleeps the pride of former days, so glory's thrill is o'er, and hearts that once beat high for praise now feel that pulse no more. No more to chiefs and ladies bright the harp of Tara swells, the chord alone that breaks at night its tale of ruin tells. Thus freedom now so seldom wakes, the only throb she gives is when some heart indignant breaks, to show that still she lives. Thomas More The Old Oaken Bucket 
The Old Oaken Bucket by Samuel Woodworth, 1785-1848, to is a poem we love because it is an elegant expression of something very dear and homely. How dear to this heart are the scenes of my childhood, when fond recollection presents them to view! The orchard, the meadow, the deep-tangled wildwood, and every loved spot which my infancy knew! The wide-spreading pond, and the mill that stood by it, the bridge, and the rock where the cataract fell, the cot of my father, the dairy-house nigh it, and e'en the rude bucket that hung in the well, the old oaken bucket, the iron-bound bucket, the moss-covered bucket which hung in the well. That moss-covered vessel I hailed as a treasure, for often at noon, when returned from the field, I found it the source of an exquisite pleasure, the purest and sweetest that nature can yield. How ardent I seized it, with hands that were glowing, and quick to the white pebbled bottom it fell, there soon, with the emblem of truth overflowing and dripping with coolness, it rose from the well. The old oaken bucket, the iron-bound bucket, the moss-covered bucket arose from the well. How sweet from the green mossy brim to receive it, as poised on the curb it inclined to my lips! Not a full blushing goblet could tempt me to leave it, the brightest that beauty or revelry sips. And now, far removed from the loved habitation, the tear of regret will intrusively swell, as fancy reverts to my father's plantation, and sighs for the bucket that hangs in the well, the old oaken bucket, the iron-bound bucket, the moss-covered bucket that hangs in the well. Samuel Woodworth End of section 68 Read by Kara Schallenberg on January 13, 2007, in Oceanside, California. Poems Every Child Should Know Edited by Mary E. Burt Section 69 Read for LibriVox.org by Kara Schallenberg This section contains just one poem, The Raven. Part 6 Continued THE RAVEN The Raven, by Edgar Allan Poe, 1809-1849, is placed here because so many college men speak of it at once as the great poem of their boyhood. The poem caught me when a child by its refrain and weird picturesqueness. It has never outgrown its mechanical charm. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered, weak and weary, over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. "'Tis some visitor,' I muttered, tapping at my chamber door, only this, and nothing more. Ah, distinctly I remember, it was in the bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow, vainly I had sought to borrow from my books surcease of sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore, for the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore, nameless here for evermore. And the silken sad uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before, so that now, to still the beating of my heart, I stood repeating, "'Tis some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door, some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. This is it, and nothing more. Presently my soul grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. "'Sir,' said I, or madam, "'truly your forgiveness I implore.' But the fact is, I was napping, and so gently you came rapping, and so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door, that I scarce was sure I heard you. Here I opened wide the door, darkness there, and nothing more. Deep into that darkness peering, long I stood there, wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. 
but the silence was unbroken, and the stillness gave no token, and the only word there spoken was the whispered word, Lenore. This I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word, Lenore. Merely this, and nothing more. Back into my chamber turning, all my soul within me burning, soon again I heard a rapping, something louder than before. Surely, said I, surely that is something at my window lattice. Let me see, then, what thereat is, and this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment, and this mystery explore. Tis the wind, and nothing more. Open here I flung the shutter, when, with many a flirt and flutter, in there stepped a stately raven, of the saintly days of yore. Not the least obeisance made he, not a minute stopped or stayed he, but with mien of lord or lady perched above my chamber door, perched above a bust of palace, just above my chamber door, perched and sat, and nothing more. Then this ebony bird beguiling my sad fancy into smiling by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore, Though thy crest be shorn and shaven, thou, I said, art sure no craven, ghastly grim and ancient raven, wandering from the nightly shore. Tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's Plutonian shore. Quoth the raven, Nevermore. Much I marvelled this ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly, though its answer little meaning, little relevancy bore, for we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door, bird or beast upon the sculptured bust above his chamber door, with such a name as Nevermore. But the raven, sitting lonely on that placid bust, spoke only that one word, as if his soul in that one word he did outpour. Nothing further than he uttered, not a feather then he fluttered, till I scarcely more than muttered, Other friends have flown before, on the morrow he will leave me, as my hopes have flown before. Then the bird said, Nevermore. Startled by the stillness broken by reply so aptly spoken, Doubtless, said I, what it utters is its only stock and store, caught from some unhappy master, whom unmerciful disaster followed fast and followed faster, till his songs one burden bore, till the dirges of his hope this melancholy burden bore, of never, never more. But the raven still beguiling all my sad soul into smiling, straight I wheeled a cushioned seat in front of bird and bust and door. Then upon the velvet sinking I betook myself to linking fancy into fancy, thinking what this ominous bird of yore, what this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt, and ominous bird of yore meant, in croaking, nevermore. Thus I sat engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining, with my head at ease reclining on the cushion's velvet lining, that the lamplight gloated o'er but whose velvet-violet lining with the lamplight gloating o'er, she shall press, ah, nevermore. Then methought the air grew denser, perfumed from an unseen censer, swung by seraphim, whose footfalls twinkled on the tufted floor. Wretch, I cried, thy God hath lent thee, by these angels he hath sent thee, respite, respite, and nepenthe from my memories of Lenore. Quaff, O oh, quaff this kind Nepenthe, and forget this lost Lenore. Quoth the raven, Nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, whether tempter sent, or whether tempest tossed thee here ashore, desolate, yet all undaunted, on this desert land enchanted, on this home by horror haunted, tell me truly, I implore, is there... Is there balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore. Quoth the raven, Nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, Prophet still, if bird or devil, By that heaven that bends above us, By that God we both adore, Tell this soul with sorrow laden, If, within the distant Aden, It shall clasp a sainted maiden, Whom the angels name Lenore. 
clasp a rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore. Quoth the raven, Nevermore. Be that our sign of parting, bird or fiend, I shrieked, upstarting, get thee back into the tempest and the night's plutonian shore. Leave no black plume as a token of that lie thy soul hath spoken. Leave my loneliness unbroken. Quit the bust above my door. Take thy beak from out my heart, and take thy form from off my door. Quoth the raven, Nevermore. And the raven, never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting, on the pallid bust of Pallas, just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming, and the lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadow on the floor. And my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore. Edgar Allan Poe Read by Kara Schallenberg on January 13th, 2007, in Oceanside, California. Poems Every Child Should Know, edited by Mary E. Burt, section 70, read for LibriVox.org by Kara Schallenberg. This section contains just one poem, Arnold von Winkelried. Part 6 continued. Arnold von Winkelried. Make way for liberty, he cried, make way for liberty, and died. In arms the Austrian phalanx stood, a living wall, a human wood, a wall where every conscious stone seemed to its kindred thousands grown, a rampart all assaults to bear, till time to dust their frame should wear. So still, so dense the Austrians stood, a living wall, a human wood. Impregnable their front appears, all horrent with projected spears, whose polished points before them shine from flank to flank one brilliant line, bright as the breakers' splendors run, along the billows to the sun. Opposed to these a hovering band contended for their fatherland, peasants, whose new-found strength had broke from manly necks the ignoble yoke, and beat their fetters into swords, on equal terms to fight their lords, and what insurgent rage had gained in many a mortal fray maintained, marshalled once more at freedom's call, they came to conquer or to fall, where he who conquered, he who fell, was deemed a dead or living tell. Such virtue had that patriot breathed, so to the soil his soul bequeathed, that wheresoe'er his arrows flew, heroes in his own likeness grew, and warriors sprang from every sod which his awakening footstep trod. And now the work of life and death hung on the passing of a breath. The fire of conflict burned within, the battle trembled to begin, yet while the Austrians held their ground, point for attack was nowhere found, where'er the impatient Switzers gazed, the unbroken line of lances blazed. That line t'were suicide to meet and perish at their tyrant's feet. How could they rest within their graves, and leave their homes, the homes of slaves? Would not they feel their children tread with clanging chains above their head? It must not be. This day, this hour, annihilates the invader's power. All Switzerland is in the field. She will not fly. She cannot yield. She must not fall. Her better fate here gives her an immortal date. Few were the numbers she could boast, but every freeman was a host, and felt as t'were a secret known that one should turn the scale alone. While each unto himself was he on whose sole arm hung victory. It did depend on one indeed. Behold him, Arnold Winkelried. There sounds not to the trump of fame the echo of a nobler name. Unmarked he stood amid the throng, in rumination deep and long, till you might see with sudden grace the very thought come o'er his face, and by the motion of his form anticipate the bursting storm, and by the uplifting of his brow tell where the bolt would strike and how. But t'was no sooner thought than done, the field was in a moment won. Make way for liberty, he cried, 
then ran with arms extended wide as if his dearest friend to clasp. Ten spears he swept within his grasp. Make way for liberty, he cried, their keen points crossed from side to side. He bowed amidst them like a tree, and thus made way for liberty. Swift to the breach his comrades fly. Make way for liberty, they cry, and through the Austrian phalanx dart, as rushed the spears through Arnold's heart, while instantaneous as his fall, rout, ruin, panic seized them all. An earthquake could not overthrow a city with a surer blow. Thus Switzerland again was free, thus death made way for liberty. James Montgomery End of Section 70 Read by Kara Schallenberg on January 13, 2007, in Oceanside, California. Poems Every Child Should Know, edited by Mary E. Burt. Section 71, read for LibriVox.org by Kara Schallenberg. This section contains the following poems. Life, I Know Not What Thou Art. Mercy. Polonius's Advice. A Fragment from Mark Antony's Speech. And The Skylark. Part 6 Continued. Life, I know not what thou art. Life, I know not what thou art, but know that thou and I must part, and when, or how, or where we met, I own to me's a secret yet. Life, we've been long together, through pleasant and through cloudy weather. Tis hard to part when friends are dear, perhaps twill cost a sigh, a tear. Then steal away, give little warning, Choose thine own time. Say not good night, but in some brighter clime, bid me good morning. A. L. Barbold. Mercy. Mercy, an excerpt from The Merchant of Venice, Polonius's advice from Hamlet, and Antony's speech from Julius Caesar, all fragments from Shakespeare, 1564 to 1616. Find a place in this book because a well-known New York teacher, one who is unremitting in his efforts to raise the good taste and character of his pupils, says, A book of poetry could not be complete without these extracts. The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesseth him that gives and him that takes. "'Tis mightiest in the mightiest. "'It becomes the throned monarch better than his crown. "'His sceptre shows the force of temporal power, "'the attribute to awe and majesty, "'wherein doth sit the dread and fear of kings. "'But mercy is above his sceptred sway. "'It is enthroned in the hearts of kings. "'It is an attribute to God himself, "'and earthly power doth then show likest gods, "'when mercy seasons justice.' Shakespeare, from The Merchant of Venice. Polonius's Advice See thou character, give thy thoughts no tongue, nor any unproportioned thought his act. Be thou familiar, but by no means vulgar. The friends thou hast, and their adoption tried, grapple them to thy soul with hoops of steel. But do not dull thy palm with entertainment of each new-hatched, unfledged comrade. Beware of entrance to a quarrel, but, being in, bear it that the posed may beware of thee. Give every man thine ear, but few thy voice. Take each man's censure, but reserve thy judgment. Costly thy habit as thy purse can buy, but not expressed in fancy, rich, not gaudy for the apparel oft proclaims the man. Neither a borrower nor a lender be, for loan oft loses both itself and friend, and borrowing dulls the edge of husbandry. This above all, to thine own self be true, and it must follow, as the night the day, thou canst not then be false to any man. Shakespeare 
from Hamlet. A fragment from Mark Antony's speech. This was the noblest Roman of them all. All the conspirators, save only he, did that they did in envy of great Caesar. He only, in a general honest thought, and common good to all, made one of them. His life was gentle, and the elements so mixed in him, that nature might stand up and say to all the world, This was a man. Shakespeare from Julius Caesar The Skylark Bird of the wilderness, blithesome and cumberless, sweet be thy matin o'er moorland and lee. Emblem of happiness, blessed is thy dwelling place, O oh, to abide in the desert with thee. Wild is thy lay, and loud, far in the downy cloud, love gives it energy, love gave it birth. Where on thy dewy wing, where art thou journeying? Thy lay is in heaven, thy love is on earth. O'er fell and fountain sheen, O'er moor and mountain green, O'er the red streamer that heralds the day, Over the cloudlet dim, Over the rainbow's rim, Musical cherub, soar, singing away. Then when the gloaming comes, Low in the heather blooms, Sweet will thy welcome and bed of love be. Emblem of happiness, Blessed is thy dwelling place, O oh, to abide in the desert with thee. Thomas Hogg. End of section seventy one. Read by Kara Schallenberg on January thirteenth, two thousand seven, in Oceanside, California. Poems Every Child Should Know. Edited by Mary E. Burt. Section 72, read for LibriVox.org by Kara Schallenberg. This section contains the following poems. The Choir Invisible. The World is Too Much With Us. Sonnet on His Blindness. And She Was a Phantom of Delight. Part 6 continued. The Choir Invisible. The Choir Invisible by George Eliot. 1819 to 1880, is a fitting exposition in poetry of this Shakespeare of prose. Oh, may I join the choir invisible of those immortal dead who live again, in minds made better by their presence, live in pulses stirred to generosity, in deeds of daring rectitude, in scorn of miserable aims that end with self in thoughts sublime that pierce the night like stars, and with their mild persistence urge men's minds to vaster issues. May I reach that purest heaven, be to other souls the cup of strength in some great agony, and kindle generous ardor, feed pure love, beget the smiles that have no cruelty, be the sweet presence of good diffused, and in diffusion ever more intense." So shall I join the choir invisible, whose music is the gladness of the world. George Eliot The world is too much with us. The world is too much with us, by Wordsworth, 1770 to 1850, is perhaps the greatest sonnet ever written. It is true that the eyes of the soul are blinded by a surfeit of worldly goods. I went to the Lake District, England, said John Burroughs, to see what kind of a country could produce a Wordsworth. Of course he found simple houses, simple people, barren moors, heather-clad mountains, wild flowers, calm lakes, plain, rugged simplicity. The world is too much with us. Late and soon, getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. Little we see in nature that is ours. We have given our hearts away, a sordid boon. This sea that bears her bosom to the moon, The winds that will be howling at all hours, And are upgathered now like sleeping flowers. 
For this, for everything, we are out of tune. It moves us not. Great God, I'd rather be a pagan, suckled in a creed outworn. So might I, standing on this pleasant lea, have glimpses that would make me less forlorn. Have sight of Proteus rising from the sea, or hear old Triton blow his weathered horn. William Wordsworth On His Blindness Sonnet on His Blindness by John Milton, 1608-1674 This is the most stately and pathetic sonnet in existence. The soul enduring enforced idleness and loss of power without repining. Inactivity made to serve a higher end. When I consider how my light is spent, ere half my days, in this dark world and wide, and that one talent which is death to hide, lodged with me useless, though my soul more bent to serve therewith my Maker, and present my true account, lest he, returning, chide. Doth God exact day labour, light denied? I fondly ask, but patience, to prevent that murmur, soon replies, God doth not need either man's work or his own gifts. Who best bear his mild yoke, they serve him best. His state is kingly, thousands at his bidding speed, and post o'er land and ocean without rest. They also serve who only stand and wait. John Milton She was a phantom of delight. She was a phantom of delight, by William Wordsworth, 1770-1850, is included here because it is a picture of woman as she should be, not made dainty by finery, but by fine ideals. She was a phantom of delight when first she gleamed upon my sight, a lovely apparition sent to be a moment's ornament. Her eyes as stars of twilight fair, like twilight's too her dusky hair, but all things else about her drawn from May-time and the cheerful dawn, a dancing shape, an image gay, to haunt, to startle, and waylay. I saw her, upon nearer view, a spirit, yet a woman, too, her household motions light and free, and steps of virgin liberty, a countenance in which did meet sweet records, promises as sweet, a creature not too bright or good for human nature's daily food, for transient sorrows, simple wiles, praise, blame, love, kisses, tears, and smiles. And now I see with eye serene the very pulse of the machine, a being breathing thoughtful breath, a traveller between life and death, the reason firm, the temperate will, endurance, foresight, strength, and skill, a perfect woman, nobly planned, to warn, to comfort, and command, and yet a spirit still and bright with something of angelic light. William Wordsworth End of section 72 Read by Kara Schallenberg on January 14, 2007 in Oceanside, California. Poems Every Child Should Know Edited by Mary E. Burt Section 73 Read for LibriVox.org by Kara Schallenberg This section contains just one poem, Elegy Written in a Country Churchyard. Part 6 Continued Elegy Written in a Country Churchyard I once drove home from Windsor Castle through Eton, down the long hedge-bound road which passes the estate of William Penn's descendants, to Stoke Pogus, the little churchyard where this poem was written. They were trimming a great yew-tree under which Gray was said to have written this poem. The scene is one of peace and quiet. The elegy was a favourite form of poem with the ancients, but Gray is said to have reached the climax among poets in this style of verse. The great line of the poem is, the path of glory leads but to the grave. It would almost seem that poetry has for its greatest mission 
the lesson of proper humility. The curfew tolls the knell of parting day, the lowing herd winds slowly o'er the lea, the ploughman homeward plods his weary way, and leaves the world to darkness and to me. Now fades the glimmering landscape on the sight, and all the air a solemn stillness holds, save where the beetle wheels his droning flight, and drowsy tinklings lull the distant folds. Save that from yonder ivy-mantled tower the moping owl does to the moon complain, of such as, wandering near her secret bower, molest her ancient solitary reign. Beneath those rugged elms, that yew-tree's shade, where heaves the turf in many a mouldering heap, each in his narrow cell for ever laid, the rude forefathers of the hamlet sleep. The breezy call of incense-breathing morn, the swallow twittering from the straw-built shed, the cock's shrill clarion, or the echoing horn no more shall rouse them from their lowly bed. For them no more the blazing hearth shall burn, or busy housewife ply her evening care. No children run to lisp their sire's return, or climb his knees, the envied kiss to share. Oft did the harvest to their sickle yield, their furrow oft the stubborn glebe has broke. How jocund did they drive their team afield, how bowed the woods beneath their sturdy stroke. Let not ambition mock their useful toil, their homely joys and destiny obscure, nor grandeur here with a disdainful smile the short and simple annals of the poor. The boast of heraldry, the pomp of power, and all that beauty, all that wealth e'er gave, await alike the inevitable hour. The paths of glory lead but to the grave. Forgive, ye proud, the involuntary fault, If memory to these no trophies raise, Where through the long-drawn aisle and fretted vault The pealing anthem swells the note of praise. Can storied urn or animated bust Back to its mansion call the fleeting breath? Can honour's voice provoke the silent dust, Or flattery soothe? THE DULL COLD EAR OF DEATH. PERHAPS IN THIS NEGLECTED SPOT IS LAID SOME HEART ONCE PREGNANT WITH CELESTIAL FIRE, HANDS THAT THE ROD OF EMPIRE MIGHT HAVE SWAYED, OR WAKED TO ECSTASY THE LIVING LYRE. BUT KNOWLEDGE TO THEIR EYES HER AMPLE PAGE, RICH WITH THE SPOILS OF TIME, DID NE'ER UNROLL. CHILL PENURY REPRESSED THEIR NOBLE RAGE, AND FROZE THE GENIAL CURRENT OF THE SOUL. Full many a gem of purest ray serene The dark unfathomed caves of ocean bear. Full many a flower is born to blush unseen, And waste its sweetness on the desert air. Some village, Hampton, that with dauntless breast, The little tyrant of his fields withstood, Some mute inglorious Milton here may rest, Some Cromwell guiltless of his country's blood. The applause of listening senates to command, The threats of pain and ruin to despise, To scatter plenty o'er a smiling land, And read their history in a nation's eyes. Their lot forbade, nor circumscribed alone, Their growing virtues but their crimes confined, Forbade to wade through slaughter to a throne, And shut the gates of mercy on mankind. The struggling pangs of conscious truth to hide, to quench the blushes of ingenuous shame, or heap the shrine of luxury and pride with incense kindled at the muse's flame. Far from the madding crowd's ignoble strife, their sober wishes never learned to stray. Along the cool sequestered vale of life they kept the noiseless tenor of their way. Yet e'en those bones from insult to protect some frail memorial still erected nigh with uncouth rhymes and shapeless sculpture decked, implores the passing tribute of a sigh. Their name, their years, spelt by the unlettered muse, the place of fame and elegy supply, and many a holy text around she strews that teach the rustic moralist to die. For who to dumb forgetfulness a prey this pleasing anxious being e'er resigned, 
left the warm precincts of the cheerful day, nor cast one longing, lingering look behind. On some fond breast the parting soul relies, some pious drops the closing eye requires. E'en from the tomb the voice of nature cries, E'en in our ashes live their wanted fires. For thee, who, mindful of the unhonoured dead, Dost in these lines their artless tale relate, If chance by lonely contemplation led, Some kindred spirit shall inquire thy fate. Haply some hoary-headed swain may say, Oft have we seen him at the peep of dawn, Brushing with hasty steps the dews away, To meet the sun upon the upland lawn. There at the foot of yonder nodding beech, that wreathes its old fantastic roots so high. His listless length at noontide would he stretch, and pour upon the brook that babbles by. Hard by yon wood, now smiling as in scorn, muttering his wayward fancies he would rove, now drooping, woeful wan, like one forlorn, or crazed with care, or crossed in hopeless love. One morn I missed him on the customed hill, along the heath and near his favourite tree. Another came, nor yet beside the rill, nor up the lawn, nor at the wood was he. The next with dirges due in sad array, slow through the churchway path we saw him borne. Approach, and read, for thou canst read the lay, graved on the stone beneath yon aged thorn. THE EPITAPH here rests his head upon the lap of earth, A youth to fortune and to fame unknown. Fair science frowned not on his humble birth, And melancholy marked him for her own. Large was his bounty, and his soul sincere. Heaven did a recompense as largely send. He gave to misery all he had, a tear. He gained from heaven, t'was all he wished, a friend. No farther seek his merits to disclose, or draw his frailties from their dread abode. There they alike in trembling hope repose, the bosom of his father and his God. Thomas Gray End of section 73 Read by Kara Schallenberg on January 14, 2007 in Oceanside, California. Poems Every Child Should Know, edited by Mary E. Burt. Section 74, read for LibriVox.org by Kara Schallenberg. This section contains just one poem, Rabbi Ben Ezra. Part 6 continued. Rabbi Ben Ezra, by Robert Browning, 1812-1889. Youth is for dispute, and age for counsel. Each year, each period of a man's life is but the necessary step to the next. Youth is an uncertain thing to bank on. Rabbi Ben Ezra is a plea for each period in life. Aspiration is the keynote. Grow old along with me, the best is yet to be, the last of life for which the first was made. Our times are in his hand, who saith, A whole I planned, Youth shows but half, trust God, see all, nor be afraid. Not that amassing flowers, youth sighed, Which rose make ours, which lily leave, and then as best recall. Not that admiring stars, it yearned, Nor Jove, nor Mars, mine be some figured flame, Which blends, transcends them all. Not for such hopes and fears, annulling youth's brief years, do I remonstrate, folly wide the mark. Rather I prize the doubt, low kinds exist without, Finished and finite clods, untroubled by a spark. Poor vaunt of life, indeed, were man but formed to feed, On joy to solely seek and find and feast. Such feasting ended then, as sure an end to men, Irks care the cropful bird, frets doubt the maw-crammed beast, Rejoice we are allied to that which doth provide, and not partake, effect, and not receive. A spark disturbs our clod, nearer we hold of God who gives, than of his tribes that take I must believe. 
Then welcome each rebuff that turns earth's smoothness rough, each sting that bids nor sit nor stand but go. Be our joys three parts pain, strive and hold cheap the strain, learn nor account the pang, dare never grudge the throw. For thence a paradox which comforts while it mocks, shall life succeed in that it seems to fail. What I aspired to be, and was not, comforts me. A brute I might have been, but would not sink i' the scale. What is he but a brute, whose flesh has soul to suit, whose spirit works lest arms and legs want play? To man propose this test, thy body at its best, how far can that project thy soul on its lone way? Yet gifts should prove their use, I own the past profuse, of power each side, perfection every turn. Eyes, ears took in their dole, brain treasured up the whole, should not the heart beat once, how good to live and learn. Not once beat, praise be thine, I see the whole design, I, who saw power, see now love perfect too. Perfect I call thy plan, thanks that I was a man, maker, remake, complete, I trust what thou shalt do. For pleasant is this flesh, our soul in its rose mesh, pulled ever to the earth, still yearns for rest. Would we some prize might hold to match those manifold possessions of the brute, gain most as we did best? Let us not always say, spite of this flesh to-day, I strove, made head, gained ground upon the whole. As the bird wings and sings, let us cry, all good things are ours, nor soul helps flesh more now than flesh helps soul. Therefore I summon age, to grant youth's heritage, life's struggle having so far reached its term. Thence shall I pass approved, a man for I removed, from the developed brute, a god though in the germ. And I shall thereupon take rest, ere I be gone, once more on my adventure brave and new. Fearless and unperplexed, when I wage battle next, what weapons to select, what armour to endue? Youth ended, I shall try my gain or loss thereby, leave the fire ashes, what survives is gold. And I shall weigh the same, give life its praise or blame, young all lay in dispute, I shall know being old. For note, when evening shuts, a certain moment cuts the deed off, calls the glory from the grey. A whisper from the west shoots, add this to the rest, take it and try its worth, here dies another day. So still within this life, though lifted o'er its strife, let me discern, compare, pronounce at last. This rage was right, in the main, that acquiescence vain. The future I may face now, I have proved the past. For more is not reserved to man with soul just nerved, To act to-morrow what he learns to-day. Here work enough to watch the master work, And catch hints of the proper craft, Tricks of the tool's true play. As it was better, youth should strive, Through acts uncouth toward making, Than repose on aught found made. So better age exempt from strife should know than tempt further. Thou waitest age, wait death nor be afraid. Enough now, if the right and good and infinite be named here, as thou callest thy hand thine own, with knowledge absolute, subject to no dispute, from fools that crowded youth, nor let thee feel alone. Be there for once and all, severed great minds from small, Announced to each his station in the past. Was I the world arraigned? Were they my soul disdained? Right? Let age speak the truth, and give us peace at last. Now who shall arbitrate? Ten men love what I hate, Shun what I follow, slight what I receive. Ten who in ears and eyes match me, we all surmise, They this thing, and I that, whom shall my soul believe? Not on the vulgar mass, called work, must sentence pass, Things done that took the eye and had the price. O'er which from level stand the low world laid its hand, 
found straightway to its mind could value in a trice. But all the world's coarse thumb and finger failed to plumb so passed in making up the main account. All instincts immature, all purposes unsure, that weighed not at his work, yet swelled the man's amount. Thoughts hardly to be packed into a narrow act, fancies that broke through language and escaped. All I could never be, all men ignored in me, this I was worth to God, whose wheel the pitcher shaped. I note that potter's wheel, that metaphor, and feel why time spins fast, why passive lies our clay. Thou, to whom fools propound, when the wine makes its round, since life fleets, all is change, the past gone, seize to-day. Fool, all that is at all lasts ever, past recall, earth changes, but thy soul and God stand sure. What entered into thee, that was, is, and shall be, Time's wheel runs back or stops. Potter and clay endure. He fixed thee mid this dance of plastic circumstance, This present thou, forsooth, wouldst fain arrest. Machinery just meant to give thy soul its bent, Try thee, and turn thee forth, sufficiently impressed. What though the earlier grooves which ran the laughing loves Around thy base no longer pause and press? What though about thy rim, skull things in order grim, Grow out in graver mood, obey the sterner stress? Look not thou down, but up, to uses of a cup, The festal board, lamps flash and trumpets peal, The new wine's foaming flow, the master's lips aglow, Thou heaven's consummate cup, what need'st thou with earth's wheel? But I need, now as then, thee, God, who mouldest men, and since not even while the whirl was worst, did I, to the wheel of life, with shapes and colours rife, bound dizzily, mistake my end to slake thy thirst. So take and use thy work, amend what flaws may lurk, what strain o' the stuff, what warpings pass the aim. My times be in thy hand, perfect the cup as planned, lest age approve of youth, and death complete the same. Robert Browning End of section 74 Read by Karish Allenberg On January 14th, 2007 In Oceanside, California Poems Every Child Should Know Edited by Mary E. Burt Section 75 Read for LibriVox.org By Karish Allenberg this section contains the following poems. Prospice, Recessional, and Ozymandias of Egypt. Part 6 continued. Prospice. Prospice, by Robert Browning, 1812-1889, to is the greatest death song ever written. It is a battle song, and a paean of victory. This poem is included in this book because these lines are enough to reconcile any one to any fate. Fear death, to feel the fog in my throat, the mist in my face, when the snows begin and the blasts denote, I am nearing the place. The power of the night, the press of the storm, the post of the foe. Where he stands, the arch fear in a visible form, yet the strong man must go. For the journey is done, and the summit attained, and the barriers fall. Though a battle's to fight, ere a guerdon be gained, the reward of it all. I was ever a fighter, so one fight more, the best and the last. I would hate that death bandaged my eyes, and forbore, and bade me creep past. No, let me taste the whole of it, fair like my peers, the heroes of old. Bear the brunt, in a minute pay glad life's arrears of pain, darkness, and cold. For sudden the worst turns the best to the brave, the black minutes at end, and the elements rage, the fiend voices that rave, shall dwindle, shall blend, shall change, shall become first a peace out of pain, then a light, then thy breast. 
O thou soul of my soul, I shall clasp thee again, and with God be the rest. Robert Browning Recessional The Recessional by Rudyard Kipling is one of the most popular poems of this century. It is a warning to an age and a nation drunk with power, a rebuke to materialistic tendencies and boastfulness, a protest against pride. God of our fathers, known of old, Lord of our far-flung battle-line, Beneath whose awful hand we hold Dominion over palm and pine, Lord God of hosts, be with us yet, Lest we forget, lest we forget. The tumult and the shouting dies, The captains and the kings depart, Still stands thine ancient sacrifice, An humble and a contrite heart. Lord God of hosts, be with us yet, Lest we forget, lest we forget. Far called our navies melt away, On dune and headland sinks the fire. Lo, all our pomp of yesterday Is one with Nineveh and Tyre. Judge of the nations, spare us yet, Lest we forget, lest we forget. If, drunk with the sight of power, We loose wild tongues that have not thee in awe, Such boasting as the Gentiles use, Or lesser breeds without the law, Lord God of hosts, be with us yet, Lest we forget, lest we forget. For heathen heart that puts her trust In reeking tube and iron shard, All valiant dust that builds on dust, And guarding calls not thee to guard, For frantic boast and foolish word, Thy mercy on thy people, Lord. Amen. Rudyard Kipling Ozymandias of Egypt Ozymandias of Egypt by Percy Bysshe Shelley 1792-1822 This sonnet is a rebuke to the insolent pride of kings and empires. It is extremely picturesque. It finds a place here because more elderly scholars of good judgment are pleased with it. I remember an old grey-haired scholar in Chicago who often recited it to his friends merely because it touched his fancy. I met a traveller from an antique land who said, Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed, and on the pedestal these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. Percy Bysshe Shelley End of section 75 Read by Kara Schallenberg on January 14, 2007, in Oceanside, California. Poems Every Child Should Know, edited by Mary E. Burt. Section 76. Read for LibriVox.org by Kara Schallenberg. This section contains two poems, Mortality and On First Looking Into Chapman's Homer. Part six continued. Mortality. Mortality, by William Knox, 1789-1825, to is always quoted as Lincoln's favorite poem. Oh, why should the spirit of mortal be proud, like a fast-flitting meteor, a fast-flying cloud? A flash of the lightning, a break of the wave, he passes from life to his rest in the grave. The leaves of the oak and the willow shall fade, be scattered around, and together be laid, and the young and the old, and the low and the high, shall moulder to dust, and together shall lie. The child that a mother attended and loved, the mother that infant's affection that proved, the husband that mother and infant that blessed, each all are away to their dwelling of rest. 
the maid on whose cheek, on whose brow, in whose eye shone beauty and pleasure, her triumphs are by, and the memory of those that beloved her and praised are alike from the minds of the living erased. The hand of the king that the sceptre hath borne, the brow of the priest that the mitre hath worn, the eye of the sage and the heart of the brave are hidden and lost in the depths of the grave. The peasant whose lot was to sow and to reap, the herdsman who climbed with his goats to the steep, the beggar that wandered in search of his bread have faded away like the grass that we tread. The saint that enjoyed the communion of heaven, the sinner that dared to remain unforgiven, the wise and the foolish, the guilty and just, have quietly mingled their bones in the dust. So the multitude goes, like the flower and the weed, that wither away to let others succeed. So the multitude comes, even those we behold, to repeat every tale that hath often been told. For we are the same that our fathers have been, we see the same sights that our fathers have seen. We drink the same stream, and we feel the same sun, and we run the same course that our fathers have run. The thoughts we are thinking our fathers would think, from the death we are shrinking from, they too would shrink. To the life we are clinging to they too would cling, but it speeds from the earth, like a bird on the wing. They loved, but their story we cannot unfold. They scorned, but the heart of the haughty is cold. They grieved, but no wail from their slumbers may come. They enjoyed, but the voice of their gladness is dumb. They died, ay, they died, and we things that are now who walk on the turf that lies over their brow, who make in their dwellings a transient abode, meet the changes they met on their pilgrimage road. Yea, hope and despondence and pleasure and pain are mingled together like sunshine and rain, and the smile and the tear and the song and the dirge still follow each other like surge upon surge. Tis the wink of an eye, tis the draught of a breath, from the blossom of health to the paleness of death, from the gilded saloon to the bier and the shroud. Oh, why should the spirit of mortal be proud? William Knox On first looking into Chapman's Homer by John Keats, 1795 to 1821. The last four lines of this sonnet form the most tremendous climax in literature. The picture is as vivid as if done with a brush. Every great book, every great poem is a new world, an undiscovered country. Every learned person is a whole territory, a universe of new thought. Every one who does anything with a heart for it Every specialist, every one, however simple, who is strenuous and genuine, is a new discovery. Let us give credit to the smallest planet that is true to its own orbit. Much have I travelled in the realms of gold, and many goodly states and kingdoms seen. Round many western islands have I been, which bards in fealty to Apollo hold. Oft of one wide expanse had I been told That deep-browed Homer ruled as his domain. Yet did I never breathe its pure serene, Till I heard Chapman speak out loud and bold. Then felt I like some watcher of the skies When a new planet swims into his ken, Or like stout Cortez, when, with eagle eyes, He stared at the Pacific, And all his men looked at each other with a wild surmise, silent, upon a peak in Darien. John Keats End of section 76 Read by Kara Schallenberg on January 14th, 2007 in Oceanside, California Poems Every Child Should Know, edited by Mary E. Burt. Section 77. Read for LibriVox.org by Kara Schallenberg. This section contains just one poem, Herve Real. Part 6 continued. 
Herr Varil, by Robert Browning, 1812-1889, to is a poem for older boys. Here is a hero who does a great deed simply as a part of his day's work. He puts no value on what he has done, because he could have done no other way. On the sea and at the Hogue, 1692, did the English fight the French, woe to France. And the 31st of May, helter-skelter through the blue, like a crowd of frightened porpoises, a shoal of sharks pursue, came crowding ship on ship to St. Malo on the Rance, with the English fleet in view. "'Twas the squadron that escaped, with the victor in full chase, first and foremost of the drove, in his great ship Damfreville. Close on him fled, great and small, twenty-two good ships in all, and they signalled to the place, "'Help the winners of a race! Get us guidance, give us harbour, take us quick, or quicker still, here's the English can and will!' Then the pilots of the place put out brisk and leaped on board. Why, what hope or chance have ships like these to pass? laughed they. Rocks to starboard, rocks to port, all the passage scarred and scored. Shall the formidable here, with her twelve and eighty guns, think to make the river mouth by the single narrow way? Trust to enter where tis ticklish for a craft of twenty tons, and with flow at full beside? Now tis slackest ebb of tide. Reach the mooring, rather say, while rock stands or water runs, not a ship will leave the bay. Then was called the council straight, brief and bitter the debate. Here's the English at our heels. Would you have them take in tow all that's left us of the fleet, linked together stern and bow, for a prize to Plymouth Sound? Better run the ships aground. Ended Damfreville his speech. Not a minute more to wait. Let the captains all and each shove ashore, then blow up, burn the vessels on the beach. France must undergo her fate. Give the word. But no such word was ever spoke or heard. For up stood, for out stepped, for in struck amid all these a captain, a lieutenant, a mate, first, second, third. No such man of mark and meet with his betters to compete, but a simple Breton sailor pressed by Tourville for the fleet. A poor coasting pilot he, Herveril, the Crossakees. And what mockery or malice have we here? cries Herveril. Are you mad, you Malouines? Are you cowards, fools, or rogues? Talk to me of rocks and shoals, me who took the soundings. Tell on my fingers every bank, every shallow, every swell, Twixt the offing here, and grieve where the river disembogues. Are you bought by English gold? Is it love the lying's for? Morn and eve, night and day, have I piloted your bay, Entered free and anchored fast at the foot of Solidor. Burn the fleet and ruin France. That were worse than fifty hogs. Sirs, they know I speak the truth. Sirs, believe me, there's a way." Only let me lead the line, have the biggest ship to steer, get this formidable clear, make the others follow mine. And I lead them, most and least, by a passage I know well, right to Solidor, past Grieve, and there lay them safe and sound, and if one ship misbehave, keel so much as great the ground, why, I've nothing but my life, here's my head, cries Herveril. Not a minute more to wait, Steer us in, then, small and great. Take the helm, lead the line, save the squadron, cried its chief. Captains, give the sailor place. He is admiral, in brief. Still the north wind, by God's grace. See the noble fellow's face, as the big ship, with a bound, clears the entry like a hound. Keeps the passage as its inch of way, where the wide sea's profound. See, safe through shoal and rock, how they follow in a flock. Not a ship that misbehaves, not a keel that grates the ground, not a spar that comes to grief. The peril, see, is past, all are harboured to the last, and just as Herveril hollers, anchor, sure as fate, up the English come, too late. So the storm subsides to calm, they see the green trees wave on the heights o'er looking grave, hearts that bled are stanched with balm. Just our rapture to enhance, 
Let the English rake the bay, gnash their teeth, and glare askance, as they cannonade away. Neath rampired Solidor, pleasant riding on the rance. How hope succeeds despair on each captain's countenance. Outburst all with one accord. This is paradise for hell. Let France, let France's king thank the man that did the thing. What a shout, and all one word. Herve real. As he stepped in front once more, not a symptom of surprise in the frank blue Breton eyes, just the same man as before. Then said Damfreville, My friend, I must speak out at the end, though I find the speaking hard. Praise is deeper than the lips, you have saved the king his ships, you must name your own reward. Faith, our sun was near eclipse, demand whate'er you will, France remains your debtor still. Ask to heart's content, and have, or my name's not Damfreville. Then a beam of fun out broke on the bearded mouth that spoke, as the honest heart laughed through those frank eyes of Breton blue. Since I needs must say my say, since on board the duty's done, and from Mallow Roads to Croisic Point, what is it but a run? Since tis ask and have, I may, since the others go ashore, come, a good whole holiday, leave to go and see my wife, whom I call the Belle Aurore. That he asked, and that he got, nothing more. Name and deed alike are lost, not a pillar nor a post in his croisic keeps alive the feet as it befell, not a head in white and black on a single fishing smack in memory of the man, but for whom had gone to rack all that France saved from the fight whence England bore the bell. Go to Paris, rank on rank, search the heroes flung pell-mell on the Louvre, face and flank. You shall look long enough ere you come to Hervareel. So, for better and for worse, Hervareel, accept my verse. In my verse, Hervareel, do thou once more save the squadron, honour France, love thy wife, the Belle Aurore. Robert Browning End of section 77 Read by Kara Schallenberg on January 15, 2007, in Oceanside, California. Poems Every Child Should Know, edited by Mary E. Burt. Section 78, read for LibriVox.org by Kara Schallenberg. This section contains two poems, The Problem and To America. Part 6 continued. The Problem. The Problem, by Ralph Waldo Emerson, 1803-1880, is quoted from one end of the world to the other. Emerson teaches one lesson above all others, that each soul must work out for itself its latent force, its own individual expression, and that with a sad sincerity. The bishop of the soul can do no more. I like a church, I like a cowl, I love a prophet of the soul, And on my heart monastic aisles Fall like sweet strains or pensive smiles. Yet not for all his faith can see Would I that cowled churchman be. Why should the vest on him allure Which I could not on me endure? Not from a vain or shallow thought His awful Jove young Phidias brought, Never from lips of cunning fell the thrilling Delphic oracle. Out from the heart of nature rolled the burdens of the Bible old. The litanies of nations came, like the volcano's tongue of flame, up from the burning core below, the canticles of love and woe. The hand that rounded Peter's dome, and groined the isles of Christian Rome, wrought in a sad certainty, himself from God he could not free. He builded better than he knew, the conscious stone to beauty grew. Knowst thou what wove yon woodbird's nest of leaves and feathers from her breast? Or how the fish outbuilt her shell, painting with morn each annual cell? Or how the sacred pine tree adds to her old leaves new myriads? Such and so grew these holy piles, while love and terror laid the tiles earth proudly wears the Parthenon, as the best gem upon her zone, 
and morning opes with haste her lids to gaze upon the pyramids. O'er England's abbeys bends the sky, as on its friends with kindred eye, for out of thought's interior sphere these wonders rose to upper air, and nature gladly gave them place, adopted them into her race, and granted them an equal date with Andes and with Ararat. These temples grew as grows the grass, art might obey, but not surpass. The passive master lent his hand to the vast soul that o'er him planned, and the same power that reared the shrine bestrode the tribes that knelt within. Ever the fiery Pentecost girds with one flame the countless host, trances the heart through chanting choirs, and through the priest the mind inspires. The word unto the prophet spoken was writ on tables yet unbroken. The word by seers or sibyls told in groves of oak or fanes of gold still floats upon the morning wind, still whispers to the willing mind. One accent of the Holy Ghost the heedless world hath never lost. I know what say the fathers wise, the book itself before me lies, old Chrysostom, best Augustine, and he who blent both in his line, the younger golden lips or minds, Taylor, the Shakespeare of divines. His words are music in my ear, I see his cowled portrait dear, and yet for all his faith could see, I would not the good bishop be. Ralph Waldo Emerson To America to America, included by permission of the Poet Laureate, is a good poem and a great poem. It is a keen thrust at the common practice of teaching American children to hate the English of these days, on account of the actions of a silly old king dead a hundred years. Alfred Austin deserves great credit for this poem. What is the voice I hear on the winds of the western sea? Sentinel! Listen from out Cape Clear, and say what the voice may be. Tis a proud, free people calling loud, to a people proud and free. And it says to them, Kinsmen, hail, we severed have been too long. Now let us have done with a worn-out tale, the tale of an ancient wrong. And our friendship last long as our love doth, and be stronger than death is strong. Answer them, sons of the self-same race, and blood of the selfsame clan. Let us speak with each other face to face, and answer as man to man, and loyally love and trust each other as none but free men can. Now fling them out to the breeze, shamrock, thistle, and rose, and the star-spangled banner unfurl with these, a message to friends and foes. Wherever the sails of peace are seen, and wherever the war-wind blows, a message to bond and thrall to wake, for wherever we come we twain, the throne of the tyrant shall rock and quake, and his menace be void and vain. For you are lords of a strong land, and we are lords of the main. Yes, this is the voice of the bluff march gale, we severed have been too long. But now we have done with a worn-out tale, the tale of an ancient wrong, and our friendship last long as love doth last, and stronger than death is strong. Alfred Austin End of section 78 Read by Kara Schallenberg on January 15, 2007, in Oceanside, California. Poems Every Child Should Know Edited by Mary E. Burt. Section 79. Read for LibriVox.org by Kara Schallenberg. This section contains just one poem, The English Flag. Part 6 continued. The English Flag. It is quite true that the English flag stands for freedom the world over. Wherever it floats, almost anyone is safe, whether English or not. Winds of the world give answer, they are whimpering to and fro, and what should they know of England, who only England know? The poor little street-bred people, that vapour and fume and brag, they are lifting their heads in the stillness to yelp at the English flag. Must we borrow a clout from the boar, to plaster anew with dirt, 
an Irish liar's bandage, or an English coward's shirt. We may not speak of England, her flags to sell or share. What is the flag of England? Winds of the world declare. The north wind blew. From Bergen my steel-shod vanguards go. I chase your lazy whalers home from the disco flow. By the great north lights above me I work the will of God, that the liner splits on the ice-field, or the dogger fills with cod. I barred my gates with iron, I shuttered my doors with flame, because to force my ramparts your nutshell navies came. I took the sun from their presence, I cut them down with my blast, and they died, but the flag of England blew free ere the spirit passed. The lean white bear hath seen it in the long, long arctic night. The musk ox knows the standard that flouts the northern light. What is the flag of England? Ye have but my bergs to dare, ye have but my drifts to conquer. Go forth, for it is there. The south wind sighed. From the virgins my mid-sea course was tan, over a thousand islands lost in an idle main, where the sea-egg flames on the coral, and the long-backed breakers croon their endless ocean legends to the lazy locked lagoon. Strayed amid lonely islets, mazed amid outer keys, I waked the palms to laughter, I tossed the scud in the breeze. Never was isle so little, never was sea so lone, but over the scud and the palm-trees an English flag was known. I have wrenched it free from the halyard to hang for a wisp on the horn. I have chased it north to the lizard, ribboned and rolled and torn. I have spread its fold o'er the dying adrift in a hopeless sea. I have hurled it swift on the salver, and seen the slave set free. My basking sunfish know it, and wheeling albatross, where the lone wave fills with fire beneath the southern cross. What is the flag of England? Ye have but my reefs to dare, ye have but my seas to furrow, go forth, for it is there. The east wind roared, From the curlies, the bitter seas, I come, and me men call the home wind, for I bring the English home. Look, look well to your shipping, by the breath of my mad typhoon I swept your close-packed praya, and beached your best at Kowloon. The reeling junks behind me, and the racing seas before, I raped your richest roadstead, I plundered Singapore. I set my hand on the hoogly, as a hooded snake she rose, and I flung your stoutest steamers to roost with the startled crows. Never the lotus closes, never the wild fowl wake, but a soul goes out on the east wind that died for England's sake. Man or woman or suckling, mother or bride or maid, because on the bones of the English the English flag is stayed. The desert dust hath dimmed it, the flying wild ass knows, the scared white leopard winds it across the taintless snows. What is the flag of England? Ye have but my son to dare, ye have but my sands to travel, go forth, for it is there. The west wind called, In squadrons the thoughtless galleons fly, that bear the wheat and cattle, lest street-bred people die. They make my might their porter, they make my house their path, till I loose my neck from their rudder, and whelm them all in my wrath. I draw the gliding fog-bank, as a snake is drawn from the hole, they bellow one to the other, the frightened ship-bells toll. For day is a drifting terror, till I raise the shroud with my breath, and they see strange boughs above them, and the two go locked to death. But whether in calm or rack-wreath, whether by dark or day, I heave them whole to the conger, or rip their plates away, first of the scattered legions, under a shrieking sky, dipping between the rollers, the English flag goes by. The dead dumb fog hath wrapped it, the frozen dews have kissed, the naked stars have seen it, a fellow star in the mist. What is the flag of England? Ye have but my breath to dare, Ye have but my waves to conquer. Go forth, for it is there. Rudyard Kipling End of section 79 Read by Kara Schallenberg On January 15, 2007 In Oceanside, California Poems Every Child Should Know Edited by Mary E. Burt 
Section 80. Read for LibriVox.org by Kara Schallenberg. This section contains just one poem. The Man with the Hoe. Part 6 continued. The Man with the Hoe. The Man with the Hoe is purely an American product, and every American ought to be proud of it, for we want no such type allowed to be developed in this country as the low-browed peasant of France. This poem is a stroke of genius. The story goes that it so offended a modern plutocrat that he offered a reward of ten thousand dollars to anyone who could write an equally good poem in rebuttal. The man with the hoe has won for Edward Markham the title of Poet Laureate of the Labouring Classes. Written after seeing the painting by Millet. God made man in his own image, in the image of God made he him. Genesis. Bowed by the weight of centuries, he leans upon his hoe and gazes on the ground, the emptiness of ages in his face, and on his back the burden of the world. Who made him dead to rapture and despair, a thing that grieves not, and that never hopes, stolid and stunned, a brother to the ox? Who loosened and let down this brutal jaw? Whose was the hand that slanted back this brow, whose breath blew out the light within this brain? Is this the thing the Lord God made and gave to have dominion over sea and land, to trace the stars and search the heavens for power, to feel the passion of eternity? Is this the dream he dreamed who shaped the suns and marked their ways upon the ancient deep? Down all the stretch of hell to its last gulf there is no shape more terrible than this, more tongued with censure of the world's blind greed, more filled with signs and portents for the soul, more fraught with menace to the universe. What gulfs between him and the seraphim, slave of the wheel of labor? What to him are Plato and the swing of Pleiades? What the long reaches of the peaks of song, the rift of dawn, the reddening of the rose? Through this dread shape the suffering ages look, Time's tragedy is in that aching stoop. Through this dread shape humanity betrayed, Plundered, profaned, and disinherited, Cries protest to the judges of the world, A protest that is also prophecy. O masters, lords, and rulers in all lands, Is this the handiwork you give to God, This monstrous thing, distorted and soul-quenched? How will you ever straighten up this shape? Touch it again with immortality. Give back the upward-looking and the light. Rebuild in it the music and the dream. Make right the immemorial infamies, perfidious wrongs, immedicable woes. O masters, lords, and rulers in all lands, how will the future reckon with this man? How answer his brute question in that hour when whirlwinds of rebellion shake the world? How will it be with kingdoms and with kings, with those who shaped him to the thing he is, when this dumb terror shall reply to God, after the silence of the centuries? Edwin Markham End of section 80 Read by Kara Schallenberg on January 15, 2007, in Oceanside, California Poems Every Child Should Know, edited by Mary E. Burt. Section 81, read for LibriVox.org by Kara Schallenberg. This section contains one poem, Song of Myself. Part 6 continued. Song of Myself. The Song of Myself is one of Walt Whitman's most characteristic poems. I love the swing and the stride of his great long lines. I love his rough-shod way of trampling down and kicking out of the way the conventionalities that spring up like poisonous mushrooms to make the world a vast labyrinth of petty proprieties until everything is nasty. I love the oxygen he pours on the world. I love his genius for brotherliness, his picture of the negro with rolling eyes and the firelock in the corner. 
These excerpts are some of his best lines. I celebrate myself and sing myself, and what I assume you shall assume. For every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you. I loaf and invite my soul, I lean and loaf at my ease, observing a spear of summer grass. My tongue, every atom of my blood formed from this soil, this air, born here of parents, born here from parents the same, and their parents the same. I, now thirty-seven years old, in perfect health begin, hoping to cease not till death. I harbour for good or bad, I permit to speak at every hazard, nature without check, the original energy. Have you reckoned a thousand acres much? Have you reckoned the earth much? Have you practised so long to learn to read? Have you felt so proud to get at the meaning of poems? Stop this day and night with me, and you shall possess the origin of all poems. You shall possess the good of the earth and sun. There are millions of suns left. You shall no longer take things at second or third hand, nor look through the eyes of the dead, nor feed on the spectres in books. You shall not look through my eyes either, nor take things from me. You shall listen to all sides, and filter them from yourself. A child said, What is the grass? Fetching it to me with full hands. How could I answer the child? I do not know what it is any more than he. I guess it must be the flag of my disposition, out of hopeful green stuff woven, or I guess it is the handkerchief of the Lord, a scented gift and remembrance designedly dropped, bearing the owner's name some way in the corners, that we may see and remark and say, Whose? Alone, far in the wilds and mountains I hunt, wandering amazed at my own lightness and glee, in the late afternoon choosing a safe spot to pass the night, kindling a fire and broiling the fresh-killed game, falling asleep on the gathered leaves with my dog and gun by my side. The Yankee clipper is under her sky-sails. She cuts the sparkle and scud. My eyes settle the land. I bend at her prow or shout joyously from the deck. The boatman and clam-diggers arose early and stopped for me. I tucked my trouser-ends in my boots, and went, and had a good time. You should have been with us that day, round the chowder-kettle. The runaway slave came to my house, and stopped outside. I heard his motions crackling the twigs of the woodpile. Through the swung half-door of the kitchen I saw him, limpsy and weak, and went where he sat on a log, and led him in, and assured him, and brought water, and filled a tub for his sweated body and bruised feet and gave him a room that entered from my own, and gave him some coarse clean clothes. And remember perfectly well his revolving eyes and his awkwardness, and remember putting plasters on the galls of his neck and ankles. He stayed with me a week before he was recuperated and passed north. I had him sit next to me at table. My firelock leaned in the corner. I am the poet of the woman, the same as the man. And I say it is as great to be a woman as to be a man, and I say there is nothing greater than the mother of men. I understand the large hearts of heroes, the courage of present times and all times, how the skipper saw the crowded and rudderless wreck of the steamship, and death chasing it up and down the storm, how he knuckled tight and gave not back an inch, and was faithful of days and faithful of nights and chalked in large letters on a board, "'Be of good cheer, we will not desert you.' How he followed them, and tacked with them three days, and would not give it up. How he saved the drifting company at last. How the lank, loose-gowned women looked, when boated from the side of their prepared graves. How the silent, old-faced infants, and the lifted sick, and the sharp-lipped, unshaved men— all this I swallow. It tastes good. I like it well. It becomes mine. I am the man. I suffered. I was there. The disdain and calmness of martyrs. The mother of old, condemned for a witch, burned with dry wood, her children gazing on. 
the hounded slave that flags in the race, leans by the fence blowing, covered with sweat. I am the hounded slave, I wince at the bite of the dogs. Hell and despair are upon me, crack and again crack the marksmen. I clutch the rails of the fence, my gored ribs thinned with the ooze of my skin. I fall on the weeds and stones. The riders spur their unwilling horses, haul close, taunt my dizzy ears, and beat me violently over the head with whip-stocks. Old age, superbly rising, O oh, welcome, ineffable grace of dying days! See ever so far, there is limitless space outside of that, Count ever so much, there is limitless time around that. My rendezvous is appointed, it is certain. The Lord will be there, and wait, till I come on perfect terms. The great camarado, the true lover, for whom I pine, will be there. And whoever walks a furlong without sympathy, walks to his own funeral, dressed in his shroud. And to glance with an eye, or show a bean in its pod, confounds the learning of all times. And there is no trade or employment, but the young man following it may become a hero. And there is no object so soft, but it makes a hub for the wheeled universe. And I say to any man or woman, Let your soul stand cool and composed before a million universes. I see something of God each hour of the twenty-four, and each moment, then, in the faces of men and women, I see God, and in my own face, in the glass, I find letters from God dropped in the street, and every one is signed by God's name. And I leave them where they are, for I know that wheresoe'er I go, others will punctually come, forever and ever. Listener up there, what have you to confide in me? Look in my face while I snuff the sidle of evening— Talk honestly, no one else hears you, and I stay only a minute longer. Who has done his day's work? Who will soonest be through with his supper? Who wishes to walk with me? I too am not a bit tamed. I too am untranslatable. I sound my barbaric yawp over the roofs of the world. Walt Whitman End of section 81, read by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org, on January 15, 2007, in Oceanside, California. And the end of the entire book, Poems Every Child Should Know, edited by Mary E. Burt. Published in 1904.